You know what this is? No. It's a corner. Senator's headquarters. <laughs> All right. So how you doing, man? Well, I'm just crawling right along. Hey, this is cool. Yeah, this is cool. Have you done one of this, like a video chat before? Uh, let's see. I've done a couple Skypes. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're looking good. What's that? A uh, looks like a Bayer Dynamic headset? No, it's the uh, Sennheiser HD280 Pros. Oh, wow. Oh, very, very high end. I, li I like Well, the Bayers are really great, too, but I've always... Back from when I um, was an intern, they had these, I think, as we had all different kinds of headphones, and we were uh, taking sound effects that recorded. Um, back then, it was like the Diva 2 really wasn't taken off yet, so it was yeah. like that. And so we were sitting, you know, we were all in this room, we all had headphones on, cutting yeah. in Pro Tools, you know, taking sound effects and taking out all the slates and everything. They call it mastering, you know, it's kind of not yeah. mastering. but. Um, and so, yeah, uh, there was, like, I would always, like, snag the, the HD280s and put them wherever I was working because I like I like these. These are these are some of my favorite headphones. And, like, the 7506s are good. The buyers are good. Ultras, like, there's all really good. But for my head and the way my ears are, this is just – these fit the best for me, and they sound great. So, so, so yeah, so what have, you been, uh, what have you been up to recently? Well, let's see. I don't have a fancy mic in front of me like I ought, I suppose I ought to. Always. <laughs> I'm just using the computer mic. Yeah, uh, it's it's okay. It's a little bit better than a built-in camera mic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not much though. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, your room isn't big and reflective, so that's that's good. You've got a lot of um, uh, dampening and yeah, props and diffusion going on there oh, yeah wait let's see i i don't really see my picture is kind of small so i can't i can't see how well my set decorating is looking <laughs> that's good that's good you got the energizer bunny yeah are you okay you see my mr bunny bunny and over here is cal cal okay cal, calgary cal oh, okay cool dog. you see him oh yeah Looking yeah. over my shoulder, I'm a real dog person. Oh, oh, that's cool. Do you, do you own any? Do you have any like dogs other than? No, um, my living here, I, I, this loft uh, situation doesn't really lend itself to having dogs. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've I've all, I've always loved dogs, but I've never. It's been the same way. It's been either I'm in a tiny apartment, or you know, as time goes on, it's just like no, we don't allow pets. Yeah, but we don't you've allow. got a family with kids. You should have dogs. At least he, one. Yeah, but you know, you need a dog. It's like we got I, look, we got four boys, and it's like having a dog is like having another kid. Like you gotta keep it alive. You gotta, you know, <laughs> let it out. Yeah, I know. What kind of food should I get? Too much gluten? Uh, you know, all the <laughs> is my dog gluten free? <laughs> You know, and, and you know, then it's like, you know what, like they're, my kids for years now, they've been out of diapers and it's just like, I don't want to pick up solid waste from another living creature again for the rest of my life. <laughs> so good way to think of it. So, you know, it's a big responsibility and it's like, I love dogs. Um, you know, we thought about maybe a cat, but it's just like, no, no, I'm sorry. You know, Cats, at best, I tolerate cats. <laughs> time to send to cats, perhaps. But no, dogs are a real friend. Now that I'm retired, one of the things I keep thinking to do, in fact, I was talking with my, my uh, doctor. I had my physical recently. And one of the things is that I said, you know, since I've retired, when I used to work at the school several days a week, uh, I would park and then I would have a nice walk uh, to, to and from my classes uh, and so forth. And that was a, actually turned out to be a reasonable amount of exercise, that plus taking the stairs in my building. I was on the fourth floor, now I'm on the third floor. Uh, but now that I'm retired, I don't go out as much. And uh, I, I've been thinking that one of the things I really like, I'd like to do is get involved somehow with dogs. Uh, walking dogs, uh, you know, maybe even working at a shelter. Now, if I could get a, you know, a rich 
showbiz client says, you know, come over to my house every day when I'm on when I'm working on set uh, and and take my dogs out for a walk and play with them for a while. Well, that'd be the ideal way to make some pocket cash. Yeah, that sounds like a great gig. But uh, and thanks for your patience. Uh, uh, I had a couple. I do have some. I do actually have some clients and some work I do periodically. So uh, uh, I had some some uh, pop up, and I had a travel uh, sort of unannounced. It's like uh, we need you here in Las Vegas, and uh, so I hop in the car. I, I I find I can I can drive to Las Vegas typically in about the same amount of time I would it would take me to drive. Uh, a little bit less to drive to Anaheim to Disneyland. If I had a gig, say down at Disneyland, working on something, uh, I can drive to Las Vegas. I, I'm actually very uh, handy to hop on the freeway and and whenever. Wait, well, but you live in LA, right? I live. I'm in LA. I'm in downtown LA uh, uh, on Olympic Boulevard near Staples Center now. So how how could it possibly be the same amount of time? Like I look, I know LA traffic is bad. I. That's why I rode a motorcycle. Going down, going down to Anaheim and back. Uh, Anaheim is, is two and a half to three hours if you get caught in any rush hour. And I drive to Las Vegas in three hours and 45 minutes. And it's a pleasure with the satellite radio. You do it that fast? How fast do you drive? I set the cruise control uh, at about 76, 77 miles per hour. And you get there that quick? Man, I don't remember it being that fast for me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, nice, man. Not I, I, I am, uh, I want us to, to say that I am truly flattered that when I got your email and there was something about you, the way you said, uh, will you please, please, please <laughs> do an, uh, an interview with me? I said, Dave, you know, you, you started my Facebook fan page, which I'm guessing is still there. It's there. It hasn't seen, the, I haven't had a lot of time to like dedicate to it. I was, um, I still get views and still people like it um, because I know you're not on Facebook and um, there are people that like want to see if you are. So I'm like, this was several years ago. So I was like, I'm going to create a fan page for Senator. And so I did. <laughs> and I just yeah. wanted to see, would it take a life of its own and see what would happen? So and I, and I appreciate that. And, and you and I have been friends for years and years and years since the last millennium. Uh, almost. I, I moved to, uh, LA at the end of August, 2001. So okay. almost, yeah. Cause I started in coffee sound in 2002 after my internship ended. Okay. And, um, so, and then that's where we met. And, uh, I think it was either Chris or I think it was Chris Silverman who was, uh, he's the guy that taught me all the diva stuff cause he was yeah. working there. It's like you were coming in for something, and he's like, "Oh, senator's coming in," and I'm like, "Senator? Like what senator? Like Diane Feinstein? Like what?" And and he's like, "No, it's this dude, and his name is Senator." And so, like, I know you've probably t like told this story like a billion times, and Chris told me a version, and, I, and it's like every version's just a little bit different. Um, but your legal name is Senator. That is my legal first name, and senator. And so, and but you, that wasn't like your parents went. Oh, he looks like a senator. Like you, you went, you you actually legally changed that. Like what? Like was it just like you saw like oh wow senators and government critters like they get special treatment? Uh, well, you're 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 on the right track, uh, and and uh, it is a good story. And so you'll get it from the, uh, the senator's mouth. Uh, and it interlinks with, with a couple of other stories. But this goes back to when I was living uh, back in Hawaii. Uh, I, I moved, uh, I, I, was born, I, I was born in the Cleveland, Ohio area. But I, I uh, ended up going to Hawaii. I, uh, let me, you know, when, when people ask me, you know, what time is it, I explain how watches are made. <laughs> uh, I worked uh, when I was in high school I used to work part time uh, on the weekends as a disc jockey at a radio station and uh, I, I kind of really was into audio things and, uh, and microphones and disc jockeying and 
Uh, I worked at the radio station, and then I got to play with tape recorders that we had back then, the big Ampex uh, tape recorders, and doing audio production and tape editing and tape splicing. And so I'm working in radio, and every now and again, I get a chance as, as the, the old cub reporter, the high school reporter, they say, well, why don't you go to a city council meeting or something or another and, uh, you know, come back with some tape, maybe talk to some people, interview, you know, uh, kind of like news. Uh, back in those days, the radio formats were kind of like top 40 with news uh, and weather. And so we would have headline news at 55 on the, you know, kind of thing. So I got involved in doing that kind of stuff. And even back then, I noticed that when you go to a city council meeting and, and these council people, you know, nothing. City council, come on. We <laughs> sit there and they, uh, well, I want to thank council member F uh, Forrest for, for giving me five minutes uh, to speak on this, and I'm going to yield my time to council member what mustache there. You know, and they always had this pompous way of, of talking and uh, jumping ahead many years later from, from seeing this. And I, now I'm living in Hawaii and we're, we're now up in the, what was it, the, the latter half of the 70s. And I'm living in Hawaii and I'm also still working on the radio as a disc jockey. I was known as Madman Michaels on the radio. And my name is Mike Michaels. And Madman was, was, if you want to call it, my middle name. Mike Madman Michaels. And uh, I'm watching the Clarence Thomas confirmation hearings. Remember those? Uh, you, some of these people that are, are, are watching now probably don't. But Clarence Thomas was being confirmed. And the hearings were on the new cable network. There was only one, I think, at the time. Uh, CNN uh, was the only cable network at the time. And, oh, wait, did I lose you? No, I'm here. I lost the picture. You lost the picture. Can you hear me? I hear you fine, so I know you're there. Oh, the, technology fail, like at the worst time. Yeah, you're still seeing me, though. Oh, yeah, I can see you. Okay. Uh, so after save file, uh, let me see. Oh, there you are. Okay, we're back. Okay. Okay. All right, so you were, you were, you were watching these uh, hearings, and Anita Hill is testifying. And these senators, including our, our beloved senator from Hawaii, he says, rolling his eyes, um, uh, <laughs> you know, they're sitting there, and uh, Senator Inouye was on the committee, and you know, you hear him saying, well, I want to thank Senator Filibuster for giving me three whole seconds of his precious time. I'm going to yield the balance of that time to my distinguished friend from the state of confusion, Senator Fogbound. And I'm sitting there. They <laughs> work together all the time. They know each other. Well, they meet in the hall. They go, hi, Senator. Hello, Senator. You know, no, they call each other by their first night names, right? And that's when I had my little epiphany, and the little light went on, electro flashlight here, and uh, and and I said, "That's it. It's a first name." <laughs> so, so, so when I'm you living in Hawaii, and I said I was I was sharing a house with a lawyer, and I I, I talked to him. His name was Stu. I said, "I'm going to change my name. I don't have a middle name, a real middle name." I'm going to change my name to Senator Mike Michaels because Senator is a first name. <laughs> and he says, oh, they won't let you do that. <clears throat> and I said, yes, they will. And the way it worked in Hawaii at the time was you go down to the lieutenant governor's office. In Hawaii, the lieutenant governor has, you know, like three jobs. Uh, one is you wait for the governor to die. <laughs> and it took him to become governor. And two is you uh, are the official uh, publisher of the legislative lo session laws. And three is you change people's, oh, uh, I'm sorry, and, and, and uh, the chief election officer in Hawaii. And 
finally, your big duty is you change people's names. So I went down to the lieutenant governor's office and I got the paperwork and I got a copy of my birth certificate and I took it down, I filled it all out, I went down, I paid $25 to file it. Uh, they gave me a thing, I had to take it and publish it in a newspaper. <laughs> Why? Well, it's one of the things, that's what they have these legal notices in the, in the classified sections of newspapers. And there was a little uh, newspaper, Japanese language newspaper in Hawaii that specialized in legal ads like this, legal notices for another $25. I published it in what is considered a newspaper of general circulation in Hawaii, saying that I'm going to change my name to Senator Mike Michaels, and if anybody doesn't like it, stuff it. <laughs> and after they published it, they sent me a copy of it. I went down with that form, and for another $10, I registered that with the clerk, and my name is legally Senator Mike Michaels. So, so in order for it to be completely legit, it had to be published in a uh, uh, paper? In a newspaper of general circulation in the state of Hawaii. So, and it was the Japanese, uh, Honolulu Japanese Times. So, so, everybody in Hawaii, they saw that and went, oh, okay, good. Oh, giving constructive notice for you legal eagles out there. Oh, okay. So, I. Uh, the world has been notified of this. If anybody thinks I'm doing it to try to evade bills or cheat. Oh, okay, I see. It's like a declaration. It's a legal notice that, I, that I'm doing this. So that anybody that thinks they, they've got claims against me or something can uh, object. Okay, and so, and so ever since then, have you, when you like booked a hotel room or made a car reservation or whatever, anytime you got to give someone over the phone who you don't know your name and you're like, yes, the name, do, when, when you say your name, are they like, oh, oh, okay. Well, you know, do you get any I, sort of special treatment? I, I, yes, I actually did this uh, at the beginning of the 90s, early 90s, I guess it was. And so one of the things you do after you change your name is you, uh, you know, and I mean, all sorts of reasons people change their names. Uh, but uh, you, I, I uh, went out and made an, a number of copies of this legal document that, that says I have changed my name and filed it and the stamp is on it and a little uh, raised impression, made a bunch of copies. And you start sending them off with all, anytime you send anybody a check for anything, like to pay a credit card bill or whatever, uh, you send them this and you say, please issue me a new credit card with my new name on it, Senator Mike Michaels. And so let's see, a couple of the good Senator stories here, because yes, uh, it, it's taken a few years to collect them, but I do have some fun with them. Uh, one was uh, the fact that I, I sent this off, and a bunch of them, a bunch of the credit cards, I got a Visa card back from my bank, and my bank checks printed up, Senator Mike Michaels, and a Visa card that says Senator Mike Michaels. Then I, uh, I sent uh, one of the letters, went to American Express, and American Express sent me back this form letter. Remember, many years ago, uh, early 90s, uh, computers and, and stuff were still a bit younger than they are now, 28 years later. And I get this form letter back with the X and it says, Dear card member, we are unable to issue the credit card uh, you requested because. They go down this list and the one that had the little X checked off was, uh, we do not put titles on the card only your name. Uh, so uh, I sent them back a thing and I said, uh, but this is my name. And I had enclosed a copy of the legal document and they send me back another note that says, oh, you're going to have to send us some proof of this. So I- <laughs> He just did. He just did send them. No, <laughs> did you see what I sent you? Here is the document. I, I found the highlighter and I sent it back to him. And uh, so then after that, I started, uh, you know, uh, a new thing I did, I w would win bar bets because 
I had an American Express card that said Senator Mike Michaels. And uh, the example I used at the time, because he was alive, I would say, now, if Senator Edward Kennedy goes into a bar or a restaurant, his credit card says Edward Kennedy. My credit card says Senator Mike Michaels. Wow. It was... Okay, so that's, that's one of the, the stories that goes with it. Yes, you call in and you make a reservation. Hi, Senator Michaels will be coming for dinner tonight. Uh, can you give him a nice, quiet table to someplace? Out of there? Oh, yes. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> because, because most people don't know, I, I mean, a lot of people don't know who their actual, like, uh, on the federal level, who their senators are, or their state senators. Well, and they certainly don't know who the, the two senators are from Hawaii. Back, uh, like I said, Senator Inouye was uh, living, uh, but, you know, a lot of people knew him because he was actually involved in the Watergate hearings, and then he was involved in the Clarence Thomas hearings. But, so people would, I would say, well, wait, where are you, you know, where are you from, Senator? Where are you the Senator from? And I'd say, I'm from Hawaii, which I was. Because <laughs> you are. <laughs> and they'd, they'd go, well, wait, wait, isn't the Senator from Hawaii, uh, that one-armed guy, Senator uh, Inouye? I said, oh, yes, that's Senator Inouye. But that's only one of the Senators from Hawaii. I am also a Senator from Hawaii. <laughs> and I would never lie, but I would speak the truth carefully yeah it was never i'm a united states senator it's, that's right yeah i'm senator michaels from hawaii <laughs> I'm senator michaels i'm from hawaii uh uh one time when i was uh working for one of the networks sent me to washington dc and uh you know i i, I back before i got into movie sound you gotta remember when i was working as a disc jockey uh, and I was a technical guy, you know, I worked at radio stations. I worked at a couple of radio stations where the disc jockey sat in the studio and talked into a microphone and had a cough button and the engineer was on the other side of the glass playing the records. And I was both an engineer and then on the weekends, I'd be the disc jockey uh, for a couple hours. And I would, would also get out and, and do like limited news things. And then I started carrying around back. Oh, no, nobody's going to remember this. And before cassettes, there was the, the quarter inch Norelco battery operated tape recorder. It only took little bitty three inch reels of quarter inch magnetic tape. And it was as big as a boom box. But I used to go out and do interviews and stuff. Uh, so that's how I got into sound, not uh, the traditional Hollywood route of having a relative in the movie business who would get me a job. And maybe if I was really lucky, I'd get a job, especially if I had a relative who was in sound. Uh, you know, I could become the uh, utility person. And even before the, when the crews were bigger, there used to be boom pushers and, and cable wranglers and so forth before they became uh, reduced in number on most sets and, and uh, got the, the renamed the utility sound person. But I came into this uh, living uh, in, first in Cleveland and then when I was in Hawaii from radio and the technical aspects of radio and doing remote radio broadcasts and uh, being the engineer uh, at basketball games where with a basketball announcer and a color announcer and I'd be there with a little sure uh, M67 mixers which later became 267 mixers which now have become Comrexes and ISDNs and the internet and everything else and then I started working on television sound and then pretty soon I'm carrying around giant three-quarter inch tape machines over my shoulder that's what the the, the, the sound guy did. The cameraman had the camera, which was connected by a thick cord to a U-matic three-quarter inch videotape recorder, and I carried the microphone and the video recorder and the heavy batteries. Uh, and, and then only later did I start working. I was still living in Hawaii, but then I'd start working 
on some of the movies and TV shows when they came to Hawaii. So originally, I'm a disc jockey in Hawaii, uh, Madman Michaels, and Hawaii Five O uses a bunch of the radio and TV people uh, because they're experienced and so forth. And so I ended up getting little bit roles on the original Steve McGarrett, Jack Lord, and, and uh, Danny MacArthur, uh, Danny Williams, uh, you know, Dano, uh, Hawaii Five O back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s when I moved to Hawaii. I actually got my SAG card because I was <laughs> after already working on the radio, and then I got a SAG card, and they were two separate unions way, way, way back then. You know, they would use me when they needed Steve to go to the radio station to play a tape to try and slow it down and figure out that that was the bell in Aloha Tower ringing in the background or, you know, that was a, a boat down by one of the, the harbors or piers or something in the background. Uh, or I'd be a recorder, a reporter outside a courtroom at uh, I think one of one of my early times was when I would be the rec reporter. I I was I would look at the sound guy over there and go, "What kind of equipment is that? He's got this strange looking recorder. I know it's a tape recorder, but it doesn't work like a tape recorder. My tape recorders were great big units, and you you had remote controls, and you pushed a button, and relays clunked and clicked, and it would rewind and back and forth and I could cue it up in the other room with the remote control and he had this strange recorder and a little mixer that didn't even have a meter he used the meter on the recorder uh, and you know and I would go over and I talked to him about this stuff so the sound guy came over to me on, on one show and he hands me this microphone he says okay you're gonna hold the microphone and I was actually playing the part of a, rec a reporter and I had a question and it was my first time working as a sound man in, in film because I held the microphone to ask the question and pointed at Steve McGarrett as he was coming out of the courtroom. So it wasn't just a prop, it was actual, just, like, actually, just like what you would do for your news stuff. Right, I was playing the news person and I held the microphone and it was the the real thing. The, the sound guy gave me the real microphone, a microphone I had never seen before, which was, of course, the uh, four. Was it a four? I think it was a four fifteen. But it was. Uh, we're talking way back now, and I I really didn't even get interested in in television or or the movie sound kind of sound for film as much as I was with television. And I worked in TV studios with the big consoles, you know, at 28 inputs and stuff like that. And we'd do the live news where we'd have the two announcer mics that were the, the little uh, ECM 50s that they would clip on. And, you know, following the script and the director, we'd bring up the VTR for the sound and the SOT sound on tape. Uh, and that's how, and, then, and doing sports remotes, and then going out to videotape musical events. And then I got the IATSE membership in Hawaii, which was a mixed local. And so that meant, you know, I said, well, no, I'm a sound guy, but that meant anything sound. So a lot of my first IATSE gigs in Hawaii were actually going out to the concerts that would come to town. The big stars would come to town. And they would call me and they say, okay, Saturday morning, 10 o'clock set up. And we'd start hanging speakers and wiring up the console, the front of house consoles and the monitor consoles as they started to evolve. And then they'd actually say, okay, uh, you can either hang around if you want to watch the show in the back, but we don't need you. You're off the clock now until 930. And then at 930, we'd, we'd tear it down and load it into the trucks. And so that's how I got into it. I, I started, uh, you know, looking at, well, what about, you know, buying an Agra? So that, that, that first, that recorder that you saw, when you were talking about when you were on the Hawaii Five-0 and you saw this Agra guy's recorder, that was an Agra, it sounds like, right? Agra 3. Wow. The Hawaii Five-0 was, by the way, uh, one of the early shows to put crystal 
a crystal oscillator into a Niagara 3 so that they didn't have to run a wire to the camera. Oh, okay. So because originally the sync was a cable to the camera and the, and the recorder actually had to be wired. That's what that little plug on the Nagra was for. That little four prong plug that, that uh, so many old timers are going to be familiar with and the young folks aren't going to understand at all. Okay. <laughs> well, <coughs> what, what that, I was, <laughs> that was where we plugged in the connection to the camera so that a pulse would come by from the camera that would uh, keep the, the recorder and the camera clicking, humming together in sync. Then later on, when they put a crystal oscillator inside the Nagras, and the first ones were kind of homebrew deals that were rigged up. And, and like I said, Hawaii Five O was actually one of the early shows that, that, that worked with this. It was CBS television, and uh, they, they put an oscillator in, and so then, they used one of the pins on that four prong plug to be the output of the oscillator. And the little plug that you used to put on was basically to take the output of the oscillator and feed it to the input of the sync uh, circuitry. On the camera? On the camera. Okay, this is before now, time code. We weren't connected to the camera anymore. You, you were connected to a crystal oscillator that was accurate and there was another crystal oscillator on the camera. And so the camera was controlled by the crystal oscillator and the Nagra was controlled by the crystal oscillator. And the crystal oscillator, this was also the same time that the uh, digital wa watches were, were coming out, the Pulsar watch and stuff. Uh, Bulova had the Accutron watch, which was accurate to you know one second a week or something like that. And so this crystal oscillator would provide the accuracy uh, to keep the, the sound recorder and the camera recorder running at the same speed, even in spite of little fluctuations in the voltage and the current draws that would happen. Okay, so it's like the, the equivalent of today of like having a time code box that is, this is feeding the camera and this is feeding the recorder. Right. Only time code really wasn't, simply time code wasn't a thing then. No, it wasn't. I, I also worked very early on, since this is going to be a long conversation, because I'm, <laughs> I am going to explain to you all the secrets of watchmaking, the <laughs> time it is. Um, the Simpty time code was really developed for video editing, because the video signals, when they were putting them onto tapes like u and the very uh, the popular high quality format was the two inch uh, quadrature head, spinning head uh, two inch VTRs. And editing was very difficult because unlike audio where you could slice the tape and tape it together, you couldn't do that with all of the various synchronization and, and uh, frame and, and pulses and stuff that were embedded in video signals. So the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers came up with this coding scheme that would allow uh, video editors. And those were the first applications of time code and, and the first uses that I had. I worked on, I believe it was back someplace in the, the mid to late 70s. I worked on a PBS special that was shot on uh, two inch quad tape, shot single camera cinema style using uh, Fernsey cameras from Germany. The, the, the PBS broadcaster selected those. The more popular cameras were also from Europe with the Norelco cameras, but uh, these were beginning to replace the RCAs. And we recorded this on two inch quadrature tape and it was edited, they put a time code track on it which was an electronic signal that was put on the time code so that the editors, and, and it was in uh, 30 frames, uh, but it was at 29.97 frames per second, which is where we got all of those pull up, pull down issues that have plagued us, frankly, to this very day. That's an old legacy issue, but in video, I mean, you couldn't edit in fractions of a frame. But the time code allowed us to select the frame on 
this tape recorder over here and select another frame on that tape recorder over there and say, okay, back them up, let them get rolling, let them lock up to each other using this time code signal and, and some, some early and very complex and very expensive uh, uh, electronics that were made by a couple of companies at the time that were, uh, Adam Smith was a big one. We used Adam Smith to uh, decode and lock up our, our, the recorders and they would run up and at just the one, the right frame, it would be like a video switcher and it would switch from this recorder to that recorder. And the output would go on the third recorder. And then they also came up with the insert editing and, and, and all of these other things all came from video. And on this particular special, which was done on uh, PBS, uh, it was called Damien. It was about uh, Hawaii's legendary and now sainted Father Damien. Uh, very creative guy at PBS. Uh, Nino J. Martin was the uh, uh, producer and director. Wade Kuvion was the, the cinematographer and uh, a friend of mine and partner in Hawaii, Jim Walters, uh, was hired to be the audio engineer and I was his audio assistant. Uh, and we came up with the plan to do the soundtrack for this special, which had gotten some significant funding. So we went and did the soundtrack for the special at a recording studio which had a 16-track audio recorder. So we did multi-track, like this was a, the big new thing for making records, and we went to Sounds of Hawaii, a recording studio that was in Hawaii, owned by another gentleman, Herb Ono. I like, like to give all these props to names that nobody understands, but makes me feel nice to remember them. I'm enjoying the walk down memory lane too, folks. Yeah. And we laid time code on the bottom track of the tape, and we knew it was a, a, a god-awful signal. And so we already had planned that we were going to leave a blank track on the analog tape next to the time code, because the whole idea of these multi-track recorders was putting 16 heads on uh, an inch of tape. Uh, puts the heads very close together and magnetic fields carry. So that took up two of our 16 tracks. And then we started laying down, then we put the dialogue and all we had was dry dialogue. We had actually arranged to sew uh, an EVCO90 was a little lavalier mic back in those days. It was almost like a button. And we actually had it sewn into the costume and disguised as with the, the fabric as one of the buttons on Father Damien's Cossack. And Father the Damien production, which came from a play, was a soliloquy. It was uh, one of those one-man productions. It's Father Damien's ghost traveling back and revisiting his life and narrating it for us. So all the dialogue was from that one mic, recorded dry on one track, of the two inch VTR, which at that point had two tracks, and uh, another track on the VTR had the time code. And then we started adding reverb and music, and we went out on location and recorded church organs in the churches and barrel organs at a museum. And we had uh, Hawaiian uh, priests and priestesses. Uh, the, uh, the royalty, the descendants of royalty come in and we recorded their live chants and we recorded live 12 string guitar, all sorts of stuff, filling up those tracks until we mixed it down, all locked to a three quarter inch work copy of the videotape. But we were able to synchronize everything by using the running with the Adam Smith controller, running the 16 track and the three quarter inch, and then we laid it all back and put two stereo tracks on the two inch tape for the release. Wow, so you, wow. you had- down memory lane. So you, you had, so you had this 16 track, and you were basically overdoing overdubs all over the place with it. Right. Did you, talk about, I mean, did you have like, I'm assuming you had backups of that. 
Because I'd be nervous walking around with like the only copy of the dialogue. It, uh, well, the, the original copy of the dialogue was, of course, on the original masters. What we were working with was the original dialogue was transferred from the two inch directly to the one to the one inch 16 track. And then uh, we used a three quarter inch dub uh, for the picture. And it also had the dialogue on it. And all the original dialogue was safely back on the two inch masters. And uh, the two inch edited master uh basically had the dialogue on it but that was going to be overwritten once we had a mix because back in those days two inch videotape had two tracks for audio wow that's we're analog that's a lot of work oh yeah a lot of work a lot of studio time uh like i said the uh shooting it took uh most of the summer, I don't remember now what exactly what year it was, like 77, 1977 or 78, but they shot it in August at the PBS stage, which was basically the whole PBS studio was shut down for that one production. That was, it was summer, so they didn't have their regular, you know, weekly uh, Hawaii PBS programs that they, they did. And Nino took over the place and uh, they, they shot it like a, a cinema style and uh turned it in won a pulitzer prize damien back in oh, the wow. 70s the the show won a pulitzer prize uh wow. which was very very prestigious for our hawaii public station for nino martin uh who was such a wonderful person i used to to work with nino on other projects and do audio but i was also remember back in those days i was mostly known as a dj uh, so I would go out. I was on a show Nino produced, one of the regular shows that we did on, on Hawaii Public Television called Hawaii Now. And I would go out and, and host, on-camera host, for the remotes. Which, by the way, we had a, a relatively little known, especially nowadays, people look back. There was an Ampex 2-inch VCR. No, no, not VCR, VTR, video tape recorder. The VCRs were using cassettes that we had. It was like a suitcase, but it was heavy. Oh, yeah. And we used to go out into the field and record on two inch. And we used to have a, a Neve mixer, Rupert Neve mixer, that was also designed into a small suitcase, like a one suitor. And it was our audio mixer on location. And we would go out and we would go and run generators and go way back <laughs> on, on the various islands on location and bring in the, the Hawaiian, both the popular groups and the, the uh, cultural groups and do specials. I, I, I used this Neve mixer, which was, belonged to the station. On some occasions, I rented them my own. Uh, portable eight channel mixer that I, I bought for this kind of work, which was a Panasonic. It was also in a little suitcase. I, I bought that Panasonic actually for doing sports remotes. Well, I used to get, when I was living in Hawaii again, uh, and folks I know, if you're listening to this and you're saying, wow, what is with all these old stories? Well, this is the evolution of a sound person because I was, the, the person in Hawaii, I had all the networks, NBC, CBS, there was Mutual Radio Network, uh, Learfield Communications, which is today a huge powerhouse, a major uh, stock uh, that people invest in uh, that buys the rights to school sports programs and then packages them up. Uh, you, you, unbelievable. You know, and in Hawaii, it was a big deal. They had basketball tournaments and, and, and uh, the, the original Pro Bowl. Uh, well, actually, even before the Pro Bowl, it was called the Hula Bowl at a rickety old stadium before they built the, the big uh, steel rusted stadium that they're now starting to think about finally replacing. But uh, and if a team got invited to come to Hawaii to play football, 
or basketball, you know, their broadcaster, you know, but that was like a big deal. Oh, how, what are we going to do? How are we going to get the broadcast back from, from Hawaii? You know, do we have to send three or four people? You know, it's going to be expensive to send them all over there. And I used to get calls from all these broadcasters, like I said, Learfield and all the, the major networks. We need a radio engineer. I'd get, I'd get calls from the, the TV truck companies uh, back in the old days. You know, uh, we're going to need some audio people. I, I worked for NBC uh, when I was living back in Hawaii back in the 1970s. I walked up and down the sidelines of uh, hula bowl games with O.J. Simpson, who was the NBC sports reporter on the sidelines. Wow. That's how far back I knew O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson. He's, uh, he's getting so, out, man. He's, you, you, man. You guys can maybe hang out. He is the gift that keeps <laughs> on giving. <laughs> when, uh, I worked with O.J. Simpson with NBC Sports on hula bowls. This is a little cross uh, divergence here. Uh, I then, when I was early coming to Hollywood, I actually worked with him on Naked Gun 33 and a third. Oh, wow. And then he got in, into some trouble, and I happened to, <laughs> so. um, we were, <laughs> I happened to at the time be, you know, working again as a sound person, because like I said, I was not really fully engulfed in, you know, like, like the guys that had come up through the film business that started out as a utility technician or a boom pusher or, or even just a PA and worked their way up to a boom operator where they were a full-time boom operator for 11 or 15 years before they finally moved up to being a mixer, you know, and then it did nothing but big features or did nothing but episodic TV. I was coming across from, you know, being at TV news and doing beta. Now beta cams were in folks. So the mixer was carrying an FP31 which later became the uh, two-channel FP32, which later became the FP33 and 33A and so forth. Um, but I was, at that time, the news organizations were all calling me up. I was working for ABC. Well, actually, the first call I got was uh, there was something going on, and it was, enter uh, no, uh, not entertainment tonight, hard copy. And they sent me out to uh, this uh, house out uh, near Bundy Avenue and uh, this estate in, in that area, you know, and we sat around and uh, they, they, there was the Bronco was parked there and, and O.J. Simpson was coming back from Chicago because his ex-wife had been killed. And then I, I got done on that day's work, and a couple days later, I get a call from ABC News, Network News, which, by the way, was a big difference because uh, while the ABC Channel 7 in Los Angeles had a bunch of their own crews, there was also Network News. And I got called by ABC Network News, and I saw Johnny Cochran at the ABC studios the night of the low-speed Bronco chase. Wow. And then I spent months working. Uh, I'd go with the cameraman down to the jail, and we would, on the weekends, we would do the stakeout at the jail <laughs> just to see who came to visit OJ. Jeez. Me and a camera guy. And, and, and the other networks would be there, too. And it was like, well, if, if CBS is there, then we and, – and, and some days I'd get called first by CBS. I worked a lot for CBS. I worked a lot for NBC. I worked a lot for ABC. Uh, I got, and, and then there was the trial. I worked a lot during the trial. I worked less for ABC and more for CBS and NBC. Used to go down to the courthouse every damn day. Wow. And, and then after he got acquitted, I get a call one day, uh, somebody that, that knew me and my name had come up. And was I interested in working on a project, I'd have to sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement. Sure, I do that. What's the problem? Is it? Go to their office, sign the NDA. We are going to be doing O.J. Simpson's interview. He's going to tell his side of this all. So there I was, and I remember it was the holiday season, and I was at O.J. Simpson's estate 
in what was it, Bill Air? No, not Bill Air. Uh, Bundy was his. Anyhow, was it, was I was it, somewhere where people with lots of money live. Yeah, one of those. <laughs> it, as the old saying goes, it'll come to me. Was it Brentwood? Brentwood, yes. I was at the Brentwood estate, and I remember one night uh, coming out, uh, and it was dark because it was winter time. And when we got done and I walked out and the lights hit me and suddenly everybody was sticking microphones and cameras in. Because <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, they, didn't, they didn't know why you were there then, right? They didn't well, know that was they were beginning to get the idea. I mean, if you ever see, and, and in fact, I've got some place and I, I didn't bring a lot of show and tell. Uh, I didn't go digging around for it, but who would have known? I wouldn't have even thought of that I was going to get to this point in the conversation. But pictures of, of me and OJ were, were appearing all over the country, like the Inquirer had it, because the reporters had been climbing up over the wall. And there was a picture of OJ wearing this white sweater. It was chilly. And you could see these big, ugly microphones. I didn't want to do that, but they specifically told me, no, no, wired mics, no wireless. They didn't want anybody outside being able to listen in. Right. They wanted the big, ugly, wired mics. And one of the local reporters who had uh, been on, uh, I forget what, whether it was 9 or 13 or 5, but one of the non-network affiliates, uh, was brought back. He had gone off someplace. They brought him back to do the interview. We walked around the estate. We filmed, and OJ took us around, and we walked around the house. I, I took a picture standing next to the Heisman Trophy. But the pictures that went out, and people literally were, were sending me, you know, this was even before emails were big, you know, people were calling me and they said, Senator, I saw your picture. You're standing behind O.J. Simpson. <laughs> I said, yep, that's me standing there in, in, in the thing. Now, we're talking about the O.J. Simpson. This is after the criminal trial by a while. Now, by this time. Had he already had the civil trial? No, no. This was before the civil trial. Okay. Which was still another gift from O.J. Simpson. <laughs> Because of all the time I spent, I spent a lot of time at the civil trial in Santa Monica, and it was convenient. I was living in Venice at the time. I biked to. I used to ride my bike up to the Santa Monica courthouse. I was working a lot for Court TV. I was working a lot for Hard Copy, uh, occasionally even Entertainment Tonight, uh, which were both at Paramount. Uh, and I was doing union jobs. I would, I'm now long since in, in not only the IA in Hawaii, but I've now joined the IA in Los Angeles, 695. And, uh, and yes, I am doing some TV show work because uh, I, I'm also working on Star Trek The Next Generation doing second unit. Uh, I, I later started working on Baywatch uh, doing second unit, which by the way, Baywatch in particular was one of the early shows to do what is now standard procedure. And that is, basically a full-time second unit. Every episode of Baywatch where other shoes, other shows would shoot seven day episodes. Baywatch would shoot each episode, four days of first unit, three days of second unit. Oh, okay. And that was a regular thing because we'd be the ones, we'd go out on a boat, uh, speed boats, cigarette boats, racing boats, yachts, Tankers, Coast Guard cutters, jet skis, uh, dinghies. We had a bunch of uh, technical boats that we went out with. We had places where we'd shoot, uh, where we could go out on a jetty and we could have the actors in the water and it looked like they were out in the middle of nowhere in the ocean and, and we could shoot them. I did the tank shots. Uh, people say the tank, the underwater work. Well, on, on the underwater days, uh, which were second unit. It was the second unit crew and the second unit DP was the underwater photographer as well. In the water, under the water. And if they came bobbing up and said, there's someone else down there. I was there, get that line. <laughs> uh, so 
why did I bring this up in the middle of O.J. Simpson, the gift that keeps on giving? Because the, one of the days that I worked at the O.J. Simpson estate, I was photographed and the photograph got used and I was wearing my crew jacket from Baywatch. Oh, okay. This meant that people who knew the Baywatch executives called up and said, what's Baywatch got to do with O.J. Simpson? And I called in and I, I went, you know, I'm sorry, I got to admit, got to admit, dumb, 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 but that was the jacket I was wearing. It was chilly. I put <laughs> my jacket on in the morning and I went to work. I'm sorry, you know, and you know, oh, well, all right. That note, I guess any mention is better than no mention. <laughs> Because I worked, I worked on, I always tell people, I worked for years doing Star Trek, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, a little bit uh, when uh, Next Generation ended. I, I worked for a little while doing second unit on Voyager. Did some other stuff, did some second unit stuff for a couple of the movies. Uh, great thrill working on second unit. Star Trek was, was very much a family. On second unit, one of the DPs that we sometimes had on second unit was Jerry Finnerman. Okay. I don't real Trekkies out there already know. Okay. Jerry Finnerman was the DP for the original Star Trek starring William Shatner and Leonard uh, Moore. Oh, okay. Okay. I worked on episodes of Star Trek uh, the Next Generation that Adam Nimoy, Leonard's son, directed. Then I worked with Adam Nimoy later on a uh, Warner Brothers show, Bull. Uh, he turned out actually after a rocky start, uh, which was due to his father's influence, dad got in the job on Star Trek The Next Generation because they wanted dad to make an appearance. And dad said, well, money isn't important to me, but I got a son who wants <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, these are all the, the old stories about how to build that watch. Uh, as, as the career went on. Well, then, going back to OJ, he got arrested in Las Vegas, and I've got contacts in Las Vegas, so I actually got a couple days' work in Las Vegas on the OJ story. Wow. Did, and did, now he's getting out in October, the gift that keeps on giving. I don't know what's next, but I remember OJ bought me my first Volkswagen back in, I don't know, 1994 or whatever it was. And I love the guy. He bought, you know, guys at, at uh, the courthouse would talk about how, you know, if this trial goes on another month, I'm going to put in the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> Did, so we would go down to the courthouse every morning and we'd get, it, get the lawyers walking in and then we'd sit around and they, <laughs> they would announce what was going to happen at lunchtime. <clears throat> maybe they were going to go out, maybe not. And then they come and they say, okay, they're going to be done for the day. We would jump up and we get all the lawyers going out. Uh, there were some days I worked at uh, Camp OJ, which was across the street. And uh, all the, the networks and everybody had uh, gotten together and there was a you know, little cooperation amongst everybody. And I know CBS had a trailer. I used to go over there after work. And we'd get the, the talking heads would come in. They had built into this trailer, just like I've got here, you know, a little. They'd set Lori Levinson down in front of about this many law books. And if they wanted a <laughs> little half inch, you'd see the walls of the trailer. And we'd make some pronouncement and had it appear on the, the 6 o'clock news or, or the, uh, yeah, the early morning news the next day. Uh, we, it was interesting. We had the same caterer uh, at uh, Camp OJ that we had used on Baywatch. Oh, nice. Oh, great catering truck. We loved it. So are you going, when he gets out, you going to Vegas? Are they gonna, you going to go out there and do some work out there? I, I believe so. Oh, man. What? The gift that keeps, like I said, I just... So you go, you go back with him really far. When you were doing the interviews, was it like, oh, hey, man, good to see you again. Like, does he, did he remember? Yeah, he, he had a vague, vague remembrance. Uh, back, like I said, back then, uh, when I worked with him uh, with NBC Sports 
at hula bowls at the stadium on the sidelines. I was just a local DJ named Madman Michaels, who was also an audio guy. But, you know, he remembered the Madman Michaels. Um, yeah, I got a bunch of stories, uh, you know, I've got, like I say, about him uh, and, and so forth. Uh, that, that's not why we're having this talk. But right. you, you did want to know a, a few things about who the hell is this guy and, and uh, you know, what does he know about anything anyhow. Well, curmudgeon guy, I finally reached curmudgeon status. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's like everybody's got an interesting history, no matter who it is. Even folks younger than me who were just past that, oh, I've just started out hurdle, you yeah. know, um, all the way up to, I mean, you've been doing this for so long and you have, like what you were saying earlier, you have a very, you had a very different path on how you got into doing production sound. And it's, it's, I love this kind of stuff. Um, I, I love, and you, when you you have a really good memory on the gear. You're like a gear encyclopedia. And you're talking about, I, is there some I, I well, see, they, now we go back even earlier. When I was in junior high, well, when I was in grade school, I was fixing radios. I was taking apart things. In fact, Jeff Wexler and I will we'll sometimes go, go take a walk down memory lane together because he would tell me about how he was the same thing. He used to take apart the telephone. And then the challenge would be, could he get it put back together and working before the folks came home? And I was doing that stuff. I was taking apart radios. Uh, and I got, I got, first I got a shortwave receiver. I borrowed a shortwave receiver from the older kid next door. It was a Halicrafters S38C. See, and how do you remember that? Like, that's that kind of memory is, <laughs> you know, and, and this is going to be, I'm going to relate this to today's issues in, a, in, a, in somewhere in the next few minutes. It will relate. But the 5 tube F S, sorry, S38 C that, that he had that I borrowed and I threw a wire out the window and started listening to short waves. I got my ham radio license. I learned Morse code, which I still know today. Uh, wow. Before CB, and uh, you know, CB uh, got a reputation. A lot of people got got into CB because they, well, I could never learn the code. Baloney, code's not hard. Uh, and and I am so amazed. You know, people say I'm not smart enough to learn the code. I'm not that. No, 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 no. Come on, I know all sorts of people who can speak two and even three languages. And believe me, now as, as an old fart, uh, I look at them and I, I'm kind of envious because the best time to have learned that would have been when I was young. And I didn't. Uh, but I did learn Morse code. And I became a ham radio operator. And then I bought more equipment and I built my own stuff. I used to build Heath kits. I used to build night kits from Allied Radio. You ready for this little tidbit? Jeff Wexler's family started Allied Radio in Chicago. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Still around. It's, it's a much, much different than it used to be. But Allied Radio back in the 1960s was, was the mail order catalog, and it was a big, thick one. But every, everybody in electronics had to have it because you could go down that catalog and pick out the switches you need and the pots you needed and the resistors you needed and the little metal bud boxes that you needed and, and, and so forth. And you could order them from Allied Radio by mail. And they, we didn't have credit cards, by the way. So you'd have to send a check and uh, or money order and uh, your parts would come in and you could fix the radio or fix the TV uh, and and I was building kits and I was designing and building some of my own accessories I had my ham radio station we called it the shack in the basement I hung antennas out and uh, way back in those days when I was learning all this theory so I got my ham radio license. So I said, what the heck? Uh, to work at the radio station, the DJs were also the engineer because we had the controls to turn the transmitter on and off. And you needed an FCC third class license. There was also a, what they called the restricted permit that you could get that you just applied for, but not me, boy. Took the exam, got my uh, 
broadcast license, upgraded it all the way so that I could not only run low power, you know, a regular radio stations, but I could operate TV stations and the transmitters and multi antenna stations. I was a broadcast engineer. This got me a little bit more money at the radio station because now they could use me a few hours as a DJ. They could use me a few hours as an engineer and I could make a little money. I had two hourly rates, a little bit more for the engineer actually back in those days. I was a teenage DJ, uh, but I learned by doing and I learned uh, with help from mentors, yeah, ham radio operators, uh, much like today, uh, not only ham operators, but all us sound people. Yeah, we love to help each other, but we also, and this is going to jump way ahead as I go rambling back and forth, but uh, as it turns out, as we're having this talk, the new edition of the CAS Quarterly came out, and there's an article in it called, Which Shotgun Mic Should I Buy? I saw that, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, it's one thing to say, which shotgun mic should I buy? Uh, and it's another thing to say, you know, I've got a 416, and a lot of people tell me they like the uh, DPA 4017, but then there's a bunch of people that say, no, that's not good. I should get a Sheps. You know, tell me, have people had good experiences or bad experiences? As, as a beginning ham radio operator, you didn't just go say, what, what transmitter should I buy? Or what receiver should I buy? You'd have to go in and say, you know, I'm looking to spend this much money and I'm looking at the Hammerland has a Q multiplier built in and the Hallicrafters doesn't, but they both seem to have, you know, a low model, a mid model, an upper mid model, and a super expensive model. And, you know, is it really worth going from the 7 tube receiver to the 11 tube receiver? Uh, or, you know, am I, am I, you know, just, you know, buying style over substance. You, I started learning all those things as a young ham radio operator who both got a lot of help, but also most of that help, much of that help was the same kind of, pardon the expression, maybe tough love. We didn't call it that back then. But, you know, figure this stuff out yourself. You know, I'll give you a couple clues and then you go do your own thinking and your own decision making. And then if you decide you don't have me to blame, that I gave you the wrong poop. Well, that and, – and that um, – we could see that uh, in your, your style of responses like on JW Sound and stuff, which I haven't seen you on there in a while. But uh, – years. But – uh, But, uh, you know, for the longest time, like, what kind of shotgun mic should I get? Your response, it depends. As it, and it's true. And, uh, or, you know, oh, my, uh, you know, how do I mirror on a Diva 5? RTFM, read the F and manual, <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, my, my wireless system isn't working. Your response, contact the manufacturer. Like, and, <clears throat> and, and some people would like, oh man, this guy's a jerk. They would say to me, oh, what's with this guy? I'm like, oh no, you don't know, Senator. Like, you've got to meet him. But like, that's his style. And that's why. You know, it's really interesting to learn that, that that's, that's how you grew up, the guys well, were telling you. And that's how you learn. I, I'm a very learned-by-doing person myself. And when I, uh, This is not one of my sayings, but experience keeps a dear school. But some will learn from no other. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true. And, you know, I, uh, when I learned the Diva 2, it was a lot of um, – and that's, you know, the reason John Coffey hired me at Coffee Sound was because I, I knew the Diva 2, uh, <laughs> which meant, which really meant when I was an intern, I had seen it and pressed record once when we were doing sound effects gathering at Dane Tracks. That was about the extent of my Diva knowledge, but we had rented it from Coffee and he knew Dane Tracks. So anyway, but yeah, it was a lot of sit down with, the ver with a manual that at the time, that manual was not very helpful. So it was a lot of like figuring out and a lot of like, uh, you know, uh, talking to Chris Silverman, like, Chris, how do I do this? How do I do that? He's like, I'll do this. Admittedly, admittedly, 
manuals aren't what they used to be. And, you know, it's been a, a, a long and, and eventful progression, but manuals aren't what they used to be. First of all, we always used to get a schematic, uh, and we used to be able to use that schematic and uh, some technical sections that would be included to uh, homebrew our own gear. We, I, I would think nothing of going out and buying an SX100 receiver and buying a Heath kit Q, uh, QF1, was it? Uh, a QM1, Q Multiplier 1, which was uh, at that time like about a, a 1495 kit and I would build the Q multiplier, and then I would look at the manual for my SX100 Halicrafters receiver and figure out how to connect it up to my receiver to utilize this Q multiplier factor. Now, what, what the heck does this mean nowadays? i got to tell you something. Q is still the same old thing it, it used to be, and I don't mean Quartermaster on the James Bond books and movies. I'm talking about Q is an electronic term for selectivity. And one of the things that we prized in our, certainly our receivers, was selectivity because we were working in crowded, relatively crowded ham radio bands. And uh, these were the licensed amateurs, not just in this country, but all over the world. And the transmission characteristics in a lot of these bands meant that it was not unusual for me to turn on my receiver and the skip would be coming in. And I was in Cleveland, Ohio at the time in my basement, had this big antenna hanging between my neighbor's tree here and the other neighbor's house on the other side. And this antenna was hanging there. We used to, antennas were the, were the most important part of the ham radio station. And I still tell people that, there, that the ARRL, which I joined way back then and still belong to today, publishes each year new and improved and additional antenna books, separate books you buy for $20, all about antennas and nothing but antennas. And these were our links and the, and the directivity of the different kinds of antennas and how to improve the, the re reception of what you wanted, any rejection of what you might not have wanted. And uh, we would go on and, and come up with these modifications. And I'd get on and I'd hear signals. And on one frequency, there would be a station Let's say somebody turned on their radio in Japan. And we're broadcasting in Morse code. And these are, by the way, very narrow signals. They're, they're just a carry, an empty carrier wave, no modulation on them. And we would hear, uh, you, you hear this station in Japan calling what they called CQ, which is, it literally is like Seek, S-E-E-K-Y-O-U, CQ. I'm calling. Who's out there? And you call CQDX means I'm calling for somebody far away. And you would know by the call letters about where someone was. My call letter was Whiskey America 8, America Radio Zebra, WA8ARZ. That meant my license was someplace in Ohio, Indiana, Michigan area. And so if I called CQDX, you know, somebody in Dayton would probably just go on. I'm not looking to talk to people in Dayton. I'm looking to talk to people in California or Mexico or overseas. Well, as this Japanese station got on with a JA call sign, which told me immediately just by the call CQ, CQ, D from uh, JA, 1, AAA, I'd go, wow, Japan, and I'd want to answer. Well, so would 30, 40, 50 other people around the world <laughs> all try to answer at the same time. And we would want selectivity. This was the most important feature in our receiving, was to have good selectivity. Wait a second, I got to try my button here to, to, to get your picture. There you go. Uh, I got a little maintenance message popped up oh okay right in the middle of your lovely face <laughs> uh, and selectivity back in the late 80s i was working on a television show in hawaii and i had long been a vega wireless fan 
Now, I started with wireless microphones, again, from the radio. And oh, by the way, another little thing about living in Hawaii. If you're in Hawaii and you say, I only do sound, that means you do any kind of sound. That means you, like I said, when I joined the IAA, they used to call me to be the sound crew for concerts. They bring in rigging guys and lighting guys and electrical guys and crane guys and spotlight guys and, and stuff. I said, I do sound. So I would be on the sound crew. But sound, doing sound, it was a mixed local. You did all kinds of sound, whether it was radio, TV, PA, concerts. I never, you know, got into the big sound systems as much as some folks wanted to. Uh, I was, I had some small to medium sized equipment, largely through a bonanza I had working at a radio station in the, in the 1970s, where I did a trade out deal for Bose speakers, and I got the Bose professional line. And it was a trade out, the, the station, uh, I did remotes and I did commercials and stuff for Bose on the station and Bose gave me their, their 800 series, which was their professional line, was not the home speakers. And so I built up small PA systems, but I'm talking like six, eight inputs. And then, you know, and it, I, I started, okay, I got to have monitor speakers. Everybody needs monitor speakers now. Like I said, mid seventies. So I bought another amplifier and a couple more bows. They came out with something called the 402s, made great monitor speakers. Then I, I, I worked a deal and I got a bunch of 802s. So I had, I was the small to medium sound system guy. And, and so I would go out on, on gigs like that. But, you know, like I didn't want to do the, you know, sound by the pound route. But you're doing all of this stuff in the mixed local in Hawaii, so you're the sound guy for everything. Where did I start? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. did it. I painted myself into a corner. What was I talking about before I got onto the bows? Oh, the ham radio stuff. And the ham radio and, and doing sound and uh, uh, building equipment and putting together systems and loving microphones and, and all of these things. And when I started with wireless microphones, it, oh, that's was, right. it was for radio remotes and radio broadcasts. And then, you know, I got to be the guy in Hawaii because I actually was a Vega wireless mic dealer in Hawaii. Oh, okay. And I kept units in stock and they came out uh, in the early 80s with the, with the better handheld. In the 70s, their handheld was... Kind of iffy. We used it on a, on a special with one of the Hawaiian uh, singers and her band, uh, Melvin Lee. But it had a long way to go. Vega came out and patented putting the antenna inside the transmitter, a dipole inside the case, in the early 1980s. And I bought a couple of those systems. And I bought them mostly to use myself go out on a radio remote, and so we go out to, uh, let's say, a furniture store. We're doing a Saturday remote at a furniture store, and the two guys that did remotes at the station were Madman Michaels wah, and Tom Dynamite Dancer. And so if, I, if Tom did the remote, I was the engineer. If I did the remote, I was the engineer and the talent. <laughs> Bucks, by the way. And... To, to hand Tom or for me to take a wireless mic and be able to walk around the store with the manager or the owner and talk about whatever it was we were doing or to walk outside and talk with a customer who had just bought, I did a lot of waterbed remotes. A waterbed. Uh, <laughs> what? That's so random. Waterbed remotes? Yeah, exactly. But I did waterbed remotes. And yes, I got in trade for my talent services doing the waterbed remotes and the waterbed commercials. I got one spiffy waterbed with a mirror above the bed oh. <laughs> king size waterbed with mirror above it yes oh i was the stud back in the 1970s <laughs> but i bought these i bought them and suddenly i'm getting calls from the local tv stations i'm getting calls from what i called the local sound by the pound people uh these were the people uh, and, and they were in the IA, and a couple of them said, oh, I really love this concert business. 
I'm going to go out because we're in Hawaii and it's so expensive to ship. I'm going to build the best touring sound system of it and, and make it available so that when Neil Diamond comes to Hawaii, he will make an exception to the rider in his contract that says you will use my sound system. Because of the shipping, we'll rent Jim Perry sound system. And these were a couple of the guys that were in the business. Uh, Jim Perry was one of them. Uh, I'll, I'll think of the other guy's name as, as I go along the conversation. But they would buy these, you know, 48 channel console, consoles and these great big ass speakers and monitors and separate 36 channel monitor mixers and racks and racks of stuff. And they were, were trying to buy the best stuff so that they could be the, the go to guys for the concerts. Well, I ended up becoming their go-to guy when they needed wireless mics. And I was, I was actually, you know, I was kind of like, I don't want to rent them. These are my own personal wireless mics. I bought them for me. But, you know, people would keep throwing this money at me, and they'd say, you know, I, I need a wireless mic for the, for the Neil Diamond concert, and he only will use the Vega, and you've got a Vega. Can I rent it? And these were VHF crystal control wireless mics in the 80s and so i've been with wireless mics since the early 80s and i followed the evolution the first wireless mic i actually saw was a vega and i saw it when i was in college at case institute of technology which is now case western reserve they used to be case and western reserve they were right next door to each other and they merged case western reserve but my physics professor had a vega wireless mic an FM receiver over there so that when he did the physics demonstration with the weights and the you know how the ice skaters and they bring your arms in and you bring your arms out and it controls your speed yeah and he could get on the turntable and do that because he had a wireless mic a Vega 1964. Wow that's the first one so and you know so I know wireless mics going way 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 back and in the 1980s, long about 1988, a little company in New Mexico called Electrosonics uh, that was making these little bitty PA speakers that were, ran on batteries that street musicians were buying like crazy. Buskers. You know, they buy this little, they called it the uh, Mike Mouse or something like that. And uh, they built some initial wireless mics to go with those and then they built what at that point in time in the late 80s was the cat's meow of wireless microphones and they called it the 185 it was on vhf it was crystal controlled uh, the transmitter antenna was built into the shielding on the microphone cable and uh, they had uh, mostly little receivers that would run on nine volt batteries. They did have an AC powered receiver as well at the time. But they just, like out of the blue, suddenly people started going, whoa, electrosonics and television uh, and films who had been using Vegas for years. and. And, and they had evolved to Vegas even earlier. Uh, I actually have someplace in, in, in my inventory an old Nady quad box of wild bikes. Wow. That goes back to the late 70s, early 80s. But when, when Electrosonics came out, the, uh, the Vegas 6677s were what was used in the industry. And when Electrosonics came out, uh, it was right at a very divergent point. Vega was going through some changes and Electrosonics was going through some changes. But what Electro did with that 185 series was they had the sharpest selectivity, very narrow, narrow band pass. Uh, one of Vega's competitors was HME, which ultimately went into the uh, only into the intercom business, they became they became the wireless powerhouse uh, for intercoms. 
uh, and uh, started buying up what were then the major players like Clearcom. Here, HME, I think, bought out uh, RTS. But anyhow, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, but the big secret to the initial electrosonic success was selectivity, made the mics work better on movie sets than, than Vegas were working. And Vegas' new products, they unfortunately came out with a new product about that time that didn't do so well. They, they were trying to get small, and the, the first small one they came out with, the R33, was very expensive and unfortunately wasn't as, as quite as good as it could have been. Uh, when they later corrected that with something called the VX20, uh, I actually appeared in a Vega ad in magazines and, and uh, Jim Stoffo, who was today, you know, an industry accepted wireless guru. Uh, he's the guy that frequency coordinates all the Super Bowl shows and all of the really, really big concerts and stuff. Uh, and Jim Stoffo had just gotten out of the Navy and gone to work for Vega down in El Monte, California. I'm still living in Hawaii. And I had a couple of these R33s that were sort of disappointing, but he gave me the VX20, and I actually ended up uh, being in an ad. He finally, he was the sales, national sales manager, and he persuaded them to do a color advertisement in a bunch of industry magazines. And I was in it, it was a picture of me standing in front of the volcano, and I was using Vega wireless microphones, and the show uh, that I was doing at that time was called Reading Rainbow. Oh! Starring LeVar Burton. You did Reading Rainbow? I did a bunch of Reading Rainbows. No way. That was like I, one of, wow. And I met LeVar Burton on that show before I met him on Star Trek The Next Generation. And as it turned out, I was actually doing first unit because, uh, uh, there it goes again. You know, it's it's an old old person's thing. I get to forget names every once in a while. Was it Agglesoff? Al uh, Bernard. Agglesoff was the boom operator. Oh, okay. Al Bernard was the mixer, and he had had heart surgery, no secret. And uh, he, whatever it was, at that point in his career and everything, and he was so loved on the show anyhow. But, you know, he would periodically take off. I, he'd say, especially on Killer Fridays, when the call time, it started on Mondays at 7 a.m., but by Friday, the call time would be 3 in the afternoon. <laughs> turnarounds. Right. And, you know, and they would work killer Fridays, which meant they'd call you in at 3 in the afternoon on Friday, and you'd go home at 5 a.m. on Saturday. And Al Bernard would say, uh-uh, no way. That ruins my weekend. I'm going to have Senator come in. Or I'm taking a second honeymoon. So he, he took off, and as it turned out, I came in to do first unit when LeVar Burton made his directorial debut directing an episode of Star Trek. Oh, wow. Did he, re did he remember you? Oh, yeah. Well, I had already been working on Star Trek before that happened. Right. Well, it was just, you know, you like this, to these seven layers of connection or whatever. But I worked with LeVar Burton and, uh, on, on Reading Rainbow, and they, we'd been on the big island of Hawaii, uh, and the volcano had been in, in a phase of bubbling and bubbling and bubbling. And uh, we were hoping maybe something would happen while we were there for a week. And it did. So we helicoptered out to the volcano in a couple helicopter loads. And we shot with LeVar out there on the volcano with this big volcano going off in the background. And... Um, then they said, okay, well, great. We've got everything we need. So the engineer and the, and we were, by the way, at that point we were recording on one inch C type videotape, uh, which was superior to beta. And uh, although beta SP was going to replace it, but we had the one inch recorder and we had the, the separate camera and uh, the video engineer, the cameraman and the producer and LeVar went back. And the helicopter says, well, I got to go back to Hilo to refuel. And then they called in and said, uh, well, guys, ah, listen, the weather's kind of closed in. 
all the smoke and ash and everything. So uh, sen- uh, I was still uh, Mike Michaels at the time, Madman Michaels. Senator, or no, they didn't say Senator, they said Madman, you and Howie, the engineer, uh, are going to have to spend the night out there. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's an active volcano. Uh, yeah, about a kilometer, about a kilometer that way is the is the active volcano, spewing hot lava fifteen hundred feet into the air. It's Jeez. so hot that when you face it, you feel like you're getting sunburned. And I had set the wireless mics down on the ground, the receivers, and when I picked them up, they were hot. Oh my God! And and we anyhow we got some pictures. And this was remember, cameras for thirty five millimeter cameras, uh, autofocus single shots were like brand brand new. But we got a couple of snaps of of each other, and there was one of me standing there with the boom and the wireless mic on the lava, and, and the volcano going in the background. And they used that photo in the Vega ad. Oh wow! Okay. And so how how much how many uh, episodes of Reading Rainbow did you do? Oh, I don't know. I guess it was like five or six. Yeah, I I remember they were, they were out of New York. Yeah, and they had their own production crew, but they liked to go on the road. So if they came west far enough, they would call me. And they came to Hawaii a couple times, and and great great folks. What is really interesting about this. You know, like I said, I go back and forth and wander around. Hope you all find this interesting. I just got uh, some bulletins off of uh, Variety and The Hollywood Reporter that uh, the public broadcaster in uh, Buffalo, which was the PBS connection to Reading Rainbow, uh, is suing LeVar Burton. Uh, For what? Yeah. He's like the nicest guy. What could he have... Nice, yeah, unbelievable, you know, and he made the show. I remember, because like I said, I'd worked on Reading Rainbow, and then they announced, I was still living in Hawaii, and they announced this new Star Trek that they're going to do, and you know, Bar Burton got cast, and it was like the Reading Rainbow people, uh, Larry Lancet and his wife Cecily, oh my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Why the kids love him. He connects with the kids. He loves the kids, but it's such a, you know, it's chemistry. What are we going to do? They ended up working it out so that uh, they could shoot the Reading Rainbow stuff with him during the Star Trek hiatus in the summer. Yeah, and I, he stayed with that show. I, I grew up on Reading Rainbow. I, pro- I, I remember the episode. I, I vivid, I, there's, there are certain episodes of that show that I remember vividly. And there's the one where he's there on the volcano and he's talking about the different types of the volcanic rock. The man, the lava, the ah ah, and, and the, the oi oi, yeah, yeah, we remember. And I, I was there, and and he's and I remember. And this is one of the things we we all have certain things that kind of drive you to whatever your career is going to be. And one of and I still I was probably five six when this episode aired. He took the some of the lava, and he's like, "This sounds like." just listen to it and he throws it and it hit this volcanic rock and it hits and it rolls and it's just weird sound and that has stuck with me since i was a little kid i'll, I'll send you i have copies of that picture i will send you do you really oh that'd be cool and you can post it on uh, on my facebook fan page yeah yeah oh i will yeah any like that picture was so i mean not only did vega use it but i would send it out all the time that was i mean of all the places, I've been a lot of places. I've met a lot of people, but I got to tell you something. I spent the night on the volcano. And by the way, we were in the same pup tent with the volcanologists, with the scientists from the Hawaii volcano. They had a tent and a camp pitch there. The next day, we went out, the scientists went out, and the uh, following day after that, the place where we had stayed was under lava. Jeez. And in fact, the place where I was standing, I think when, when uh, LeVar Burton was, was talking to you about it, I think he told you that he was standing on, on lava that covered a forest. It was about 20 feet of lava that literally had fallen from this erupting volcano shooting it out and had covered 
a for what had been a forest there where he was standing. And like I said, I'll send you the picture for those who are watching. By the time you watch this, it should be on my Facebook fan page. Yeah. Thank you very much. If I can remember the login. Uh, <laughs> it's been a while. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I didn't, I worked on a... Uh, when I worked on, when I, when I met him again a few years later, wasn't that many years later on Star Trek, it's like, oh yeah, he remembered the volcano as one of his remembered episodes too. Yeah, I, I, uh, it's, man, it's so wild. Like you, you, you worked on these shows like Next Generation. When that came out in the in the like later eighty was eighty seven eighty eight somewhere in there, and um, the Star Trek: The Next Generation, and we that was like one of the shows we watched as a family. And, and I remember I was a kid, I was like that's the Reading Rainbow guy, and uh, and then I remember like there was a crossover episode of Reading Rainbow where he showed like here's the model of the Enterprise, here's how we do the beam up, and and. Um, Wow, it's it's just so like I didn't know you were doing Reading Rainbow, like yeah. it's, oh wow, yeah. that's I, I, I've been on several shows you've watched. Yeah, that's oh, that's amazing. Yeah, um, wow, wow. So when you were doing to go back to like your ham radio days, yeah. Did you ever hear any number stations? Did you ever run across any of that? Any what number stations? Do you know what that is? Number numbers stations or numbers. It's a, um, it's uh, basically what it is, is uh, it would be a broadcast and it would be, a, and, and it would only be over a short period of time and it would be a voice reading numbers, 23, 16, 42, oh. and it could be in different languages and it would only be at certain times of the day. And then at the rest of the day, there was nothing. Okay. And, uh, that was not ham radio. Uh, that was short wave oh, like, okay same very very closely intertwined and and i was originally i started out with a short wave receiver before i got a my own ham radio transmitter or the, the lord knows that was inevitable uh i know what you mean we didn't call it that but there were a lot of things that went on uh because we, you know uh and, it, and i'm going to relate this to today too since it it comes up and what an appropriate time. But, you know, shortwave radio and, and broadcasting, uh, e even going back to World War II, you know, the BBC would periodically say strange things. And those were coded messages. Right. You know, and the BBC would say, tomorrow's weather in Chelsleyham is going to be rainy. You know, would mean nothing to nobody except some underground group in France that would mean, okay, that means we're on to blow up the railroad, whatever. I mean, you can, sometimes you see bits of that if you watch old Hogan's Heroes, as well as some of the old, old movies. Um, we had, a, there was, in, in shortwave radio, there was a lot of that. Uh, when I first started out, and this goes back literally to my grade school days, when I would uh, listen and send letters to the stations I heard, telling them what I had heard, what frequency, what time, where I was, uh, what kind of receiver I had. That's why I always remember, yeah, S38C, five tubes, uh, SX100, 11 tubes. Because while these people uh, at the shortwave stations all over the world would probably know the major stuff, you know, sometimes people would say, I, I homebrew, uh, Three stage, uh, three IF, uh, twelve tube radio with crystal lattice filter, two point three kilohertz, whatever. You know, you tell them stuff about your equipment. Tell them my antenna is a long wire antenna, hundred feet long. They used to like to to get these reports, these listener reports, called QSL confirmation QSL, and they in return would send back to me a sort of picture postcard saying yes you heard us and you would i'd collect them all over on the wall over there i would have qsl cards from radio moscow Jeez. Uh, voice of the andes from Kol Yisrael, the voice of israel the bbc overseas service uh uh keto ecuador was a real popular one i had uh Switzerland, the Swiss radio, uh, I actually, uh, you know, and then I would listen the following week 
and it was, you know, they had a couple of, amongst other things, SWL shows, and they would say, well, we heard, we heard from young Mike Michaels uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, who says he likes to listen to our show every week on his Halicrafters S38 with a long wire antenna stretching through three neighbor yards. You know, and I go, wow, <laughs> so famous. They're talking about me in Switzerland. <laughs> and I can be heard in Cleveland all over the world. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you'd hear Radio Moscow. I remember, and this goes back, I'm talking about, you know, my early involvements in media and news and, and all the way to changing my name to, to Senator. Uh, I used to be the local shortwave contact guy for the CBS affiliate uh, and, and when I was in like uh, seventh grade. This was even before I was working. In a race. They, you were the guy they went to. When you were they there. would call me up. They would call me up at five o'clock in the morning and say, hey, Mike, uh, we just heard some news out of Russia about launching a satellite. Can you see if you can get anything out of Radio Moscow? <laughs> You're like 13. <laughs> And and me, crazy kid that I was, I wouldn't go to school that morning. I'd try to find Radio Moscow or something. Shortwave radio was big propaganda, major propaganda. And you you may be too young to, to, to recognize this, but your parents would have. We had a couple of things. There was Radio Free Europe. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. Okay. And Voice of America. Now, Voice of America was admittedly the United States government's equivalent of Radio Moscow. And oh, yeah, by the way, I got a QSL card from Radio Peking, which got me into trouble later when I was going for security clearance. <laughs> because when I sent my shortwave listening report, sixth grader, off to Radio Peking in Peking, China, which was then, you know, People's Republic, bad guys, bad guys. And uh, then they started sending me uh, envelopes containing little red books. Oh. Which, by the way, back in those days, the, these little red books would come and the printing on each page would be a little bit skewered differently. The printing quality was pretty poor. The paper was pretty poor. But when I went to get my security clearance, it turns out that the CIA and other agencies <coughs> who are unmentionable had, in fact, been opening my mail, <laughs> which we could only find out much later. Uh, through freedom of information, <laughs> but because I was getting all of this propaganda mail from Red China. So, so wait a minute. You're a kid, right? You're, you're, you're 11, 12, 13 years old, and you're yeah. just into this shortwave stuff. You're like, yeah. cool. Hey, I heard Peking, China. And all, all you care about is, wow, they're all the way over they're there, and I heard. Hard. And they're, and they're, so they're, so meanwhile, so they send you, the station over there from Peking sends to, Oh, that 11 was year old station. That was their propaganda. And, and so they sent to 11 year old Mike Michaels this little thing. And, and you're like, probably thinking, oh, this is cool. Like, not like, ooh, I'm into this propaganda. You're yeah. like, oh, look at this cool thing from over there. And the CIA is opening up an 11 year old kid's e uh, email, uh, opening up his regular mail. Yeah. Man, dude, that's wild. You know, well, then they also sent me programming schedules. Here's what, when, you know, as the season changed and you know, getting way back into radio theory again, these things we had called skip and atmospheric conditions and sunspots. I mean, yes, yeah, sunspots are involved, folks. This stuff is <laughs> physics. This is astronomical physics. This is Einstein. You know, when can I receive China on what frequencies? Wow. And they would send their schedule and say, we're going to be broadcasting in English on these frequencies, on these days, on these times. Here's our schedule, our overseas service. Radio Moscow would send me the BBC, you know, our overseas services. Israel and all these countries were broadcasting in all these languages. And the United States government was openly doing that on Voice of America. And yes, up there on my wall, I had the Voice of America QSL card too, because Voice of America had a lot of their transmitting stations overseas 
in in weird places like Turkey and Iran. Yes, Iran. That Iran. Back when that Iran was our close bosom buddy friends. So so when so, you went to when you went to get clearance, they said, Oh, by the way, and so this you're getting clearance years after this. Like, oh, by the way, can you explain when we were going through your mail what these yeah, are? You, you had some uh, you were involved with the uh, red Chinese <laughs> government. Uh, Jeez. That's insane. How did they even know to look in your mail? I'm in your old shortwave listener with the Hallicrafters S thirty eight C. Yeah. The, the fact that they even knew to look, that's scary. Like, how do they even, you know what I mean? You know, this, this is the kind of stuff. Now, back in those days, we would watch television, and the local broadcasters would have, you know, be required, actually, <clears throat> to put on a certain amount of public service as part of the condition of their authorization to use what are the public airwaves. Although the government now is selling the public airwaves. Yeah. Uh, back then, they had a slightly, majorly different view of it, and uh, there would be public service ads that say, "People behind the Iron Curtain can't hear the truth, but Radio Free Europe broadcasts the truth. We need your donations to keep this valuable voice of the truth going to these countries behind the evil Iron Curtain." Well. Turns out, you know, later we found out that they didn't need the money. Uh, Radio Free Europe was really the CIA. They had all the money they needed. And they were broadcasting propaganda into countries, hoping to influence the population of those countries into heaven knows what specific actions like maybe overthrowing their country's governments. <laughs> That's we were, I mean, you know, we the and, and and overthrow, you know, we were sending stuff, Radio Marti sending messages into Cuba. You know, what what were we doing with Radio Marti and Radio Free Europe and the Voice of America more openly is now when I watch way too much by the way but when i watch the news such as it is on tv and i have have some good opinions to give you on that too if you want but you know what is different the russians are still trying to influence the american public and make no mistake about it we're still trying to influence the russian public and the uh, greek public and uh, who else this week the Iranian public and uh, the Libyan public and the Syrian public. We're still doing that. And what is different? Yeah, and the Venezuelan public, we're doing all of that. What's different? You know, okay, now we're doing it with emails. We're hacking emails or we're, we're sending out spam e emails or they're sending out or they're hacking. This is nothing new and nothing different. I'm sorry, people. This is just the same old same old you know and i just i keep wanting to shout at the television set when they talk about the russians have tried to interfere with our electoral process by by trying to you know propagate you know clinton i, I i'm taking no sides in this i'm an equal opportunity offender i'm taking no sides in this clinton tried to influence an election in israel because he didn't like Netanyahu, and he wanted Netanyahu's opponent to win, and Clinton and the government and the Clinton Foundation all gave money to Netanyahu's opponent. It didn't work, but they did. What's the big deal? What's news about this? It's old. It's not news. Radio Free Europe was just the 1950s version of it. Well, yeah, that's... See, like shortwave stuff, like I never, when I was a kid, I really didn't, I, I still really don't know how much about it. Um, I, I knew as I got older, um, I knew one kid in high school that was like a ham radio operator. He was way into it. And I was like, we, we tended to be, 
pardon me, nowadays, like sound people, we get, we really get into it. But yeah, ham radio operator, uh, and a shortwave band. Let me try to, to bring a couple of these things together and, and contemporize them. When I started in ham radio, uh, there was the broadcast frequencies, which went from a half a megahertz to roughly one and a half megahertz, 550 kilohertz to 1600 kilohertz. That was where the AM radio band was, and still is, by the way. And radio stations across the country uh, would get their licenses, and there were some interesting things about the radio propagation, uh, which was that AM radio stations would go from 100 watts up to the legendary 50,000 watts. We, we called those 50,000 watts, and there were just a limited number of those. Uh, they were the, what they called the clear channel stations. That's because even with a little bit of power, my ham radio station, uh, I never, I never at, at home exceeded uh, 200, 250 watts of power. I could talk all over the world. I could talk to guys that were talking to me, and they'd say, uh, uh, I've got a such and such rig. We love to talk about our rigs, just like sound guys. Oh yeah, I'm rocking a uh, sound devices. We, I'm rocking it. Uh, we didn't rock things then. We used them. Uh, I'm working a uh, Heath Kit Apache, 180 watts, uh, and into a, a, a dipole antenna that stretched uh, about 130 feet with uh, traps for for the for the band I'm on, 40 meters, whatever. And uh, guy on the other end would say, well, I've got uh, a Collins S-Line. Oh, Collins S-Line was like Mercedes-Benz. No, no, Maserati. The Collins S-Line was military gear that was scaled back and repurposed to cover the ham bands. It was like, oh, my God, guys with the S-Lines. And he'd say, uh, I'm, I'm running it barefoot right now, so it's about 120 watts. Here, let me kick in the linear. I'll go to a, a full kilowatt, a full kilowatt. That was what ham radios could do max. And I would be listening. He says, there, I kicked in the linear. Uh, but did it make any difference? No, not really. <laughs> I couldn't hear the difference. Uh, power is not, the, that's where I learned this. It's still true today. When people are, are, are on wireless microphones, power is not the key. Antenna is the key. Selectivity is a key. Not only in clear, clean trans, clean transmission is really important. It'll improve your range. And your reception and your selectivity, your Q, remember that? Q, all the important factors still important today. Now, the AM radio frequencies down there at about one megahertz, one, one megahertz uh, signal length, had this strange thing at night when the ionosphere, uh, when the sunlight was off of it and the ionosphere would change its electrical status. Uh, during the day when the sun was out, the, the AM radio band signals would uh, just shoot off from the antenna about, like the old saying goes, as far as you can see. And, uh, and they were also a ground wave signal because the antennas were mounted on the ground and they stood up straight. And the reason for their height was directly proportional to their frequency because a, a, an antenna had to be a certain length to be optimized for that frequency. So an antenna on uh, 570 would be taller than an antenna on 1330, different parts of the band. Okay. The length having to do with the <laughs> physics again, wavelength. But at night, when the sun was not affecting the ionosphere, the radio waves would, that were going upward from the antenna would hit the ionosphere and bounce off the ionosphere according to the laws of triangulation and such and come down further away beyond the horizon. This was called skip atmosphere uh, skip okay and so here i am in cleveland and during the day all we hear is our local radio station at night 
I can pick up WCFL in Canada, Windsor, Ontario. I can pick up, uh, no, WCFL was in Chicago. Uh, I could pick up uh, WWOR. I could pick up stations in New York. Not, not every night. Some nights I could pick up Boston, WBZ. Other nights I couldn't. Another night I might pick up Detroit. Another night I might be picking up WWW Wheeling, West Virginia. All these different stations would come skipping in. And it would vary. So, so this, this phenomena, as you go up and down the frequency band, so you start going up from one megahertz, uh, which by the way, in those days, we called them cycles, cycles per second. Now it's called hertz. We named this, we love to name things after people. Hertz is from Theodore Hertz, one of the radio fathers, physicist, Hertz. Uh, so as we go up in frequencies, the atmospheric changes, not only between day and night, but also affected, like I said, by sunspots and solar flares and storms and, and the weather and all sorts of things. The skip changes so that, and we project this in our ham radio magazines, they do a lot of projecting as they do uh, in other shortwave. Uh, where is the skip going to be good from? Which, you know, uh, during the middle of August is a good time to work uh, from central uh, USA will be good to uh, northeastern Europe on 20 meters. That's our frequency length. 20 meters long. Uh, frequency length correlates to the number of cycles per second. Right. And we, we look at all these things, and it has to do with the frequencies and the sunspots and the atmospheric and, and skipping and not skipping. And some bands are good for DX, and other bands are, are better for regional communications, and so on and so forth. Talking about the wavelengths and the exact lengths. Watch old movies. You see old police cars had these great big whip antennas flapping around. That was because back in those days, the communications, we thought high frequencies were above 50 megahertz. Okay. And high frequencies, we would call those very high frequencies once you got above 50 megahertz. But the length of the antenna for 50 megahertz was that long. And as the frequencies get higher, the antennas get shorter. It's an inverse relationship. As the, as the frequency number goes up, the antenna size gets smaller and smaller and smaller, which is why the cell phone antennas have become practically invisible. And right. So, remember, we used to pull up a little thing about day long. Yeah, yeah. And so, let me tell you about how much bandwidth is in a block. We know a block. Uh, electrosonics, I think, is the father of it. But they, when they first started blocking things, they decided on about 26 megahertz. And block number one was zero to 26, or whatever it was, the fraction. Zero to 26 was block one. 26 point whatever, 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 was block two went up to 52 megahertz. By the way, just for reference, 52 megahertz is where TV channel two is. TV channel two. There was a channel one lower than that, but it, it didn't work well, went away. So most of our wireless microphone stuff is now up in blocks like 19, 20, 21, and we're, we're but a block is still 25 point something, 20, approximately 26 megahertz of spectrum. And in that spectrum on my Halicraft, that's all my, my Halicrafter's radio was just over a block. It went from, didn't even go down all the way. It started at half a megahertz and went up to, depending on, on which brand and which model you bought of a shortwave radio back in the 1950s and 60s, it went up to 30 or 32 megahertz. That was shortwave. There are thousands and thousands and thousands, tens and hundreds of thousands of transmitters there. These number stations that you refer to, mm -hmm. they would pop up uh, amongst other things. 
at a time and frequency that had been determined, and they would send their messages, and the, the people that were they were intended for would know to listen for them. And if they didn't hear, weren't able to hear it today, they could try again tomorrow. And and I mean that was that was pardon me, that's just plain old ordinary average espionage at work. Embassies, you know, that was early secure communications. <laughs> yeah. Really is, you know, uh, you got to take this message down. Then we started getting, and, I, and ham radio operators got into this stuff too. We got into radio teletype and frequency shift keying. And then pretty soon we found that we could, you know, the, the broadcasters actually had been allocated this FM band. When I was a little kid, there were no FM stations. We had FM radio. That was like a spooky mystery. Wow, this radio has FM. What do you hear on FM? Nothing. <laughs> I still remember when uh, when one of the stations, CBS affiliate, decided to turn on their FM transmitter, and they showed us the wonder of this FM transmitter by doing a simulcast with their AM station. And AM was right, and FM was left, and they had a ping pong ball that went from AM to FM to AM to FM, bouncing through your head if you had an AM and an FM radio on either side of your head. This is like wow. 1956 stuff. Nowadays, we're all up there. FM radio is, is not considered very high in frequency. You know, we're going up to gigabytes. Uh, we're using five gigabytes. In fact, it's confusing when you talk about five gigabyte, five G Wi Fi, that's five gigabytes. Four five gigahertz, gigahertz, right? Gigahertz. Yes, five giga. I've got sitting here next to me helping me with this conversation. <clears throat> five gigabyte wireless uh, Wi-Fi no actually I'm on I'm on a wire now but I got it's also in, in the same box uh, you know and then 4g LTE you know and all this demand for spectrum and I got to tell you something all this high frequency stuff is very 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 short range it doesn't go beyond the horizon and and if you're if you're inside a building and you're operating with 10 milliwatts of power you know they're not going to hear you on broadway is a great example of that wireless microphone the broadway theaters have all agreed to 50 milliwatts even though higher power is both allowed and available 50 milliwatts works great and minimizes the chance of interference do you realize that cellular telephones are built on the same philosophy? Less power. The cell tower tells your, your cell phone to lower its power when you're near the cell tower. You know, the original cell phones that came out, car phones were three watts, and uh, the handheld phones were like, you know, 250 milliwatts. And the cell towers would turn them down because the whole idea of cell phone technology, when they find, when they went out and said, "I want to, we want to develop this," what they went for was a highly technological system that required a lot of technology, a lot of computing power, uh, and low power, so that there would be lots and lots of cells, and that if you went from a, cell A to cell B, it would hand you over. And as you pass through cell B, you know, it would hand you over to cell C. Well, cell C and cell A can't interfere with each other. Okay. To keep the power down and the range down. So, it, I mean, it literally, they're looking at better performance with maybe less, actually lesser range capabilities. I understand that doesn't sit well with people who are working for producers who think that a wireless mic is a 20-watt walkie-talkie like they use in World War movies, that great big backpack. Backpack, yeah, with the giant antenna. The giant whip. <laughs> and remember, when you see that giant whip antenna, what do you know? Uh, it's a lower frequency. It's a lower frequency back in, in those days and in the walkie-talkies when you pulled out a big antenna, that was maybe about 70, 75 megahertz. So when you were doing all this stuff as a kid, like, and you would find someone, like, I always wondered, like, like, what do you, what do you talk about? Do you just kind of like shoot the shit or you, you compare gear or is it just kind of whatever? Well, 
Good question. Um, because I, I, I liken that to just picking up a phone, dialing a random number, and then just start talking to whoever picks up. Well, we like to think that if we do a CQ, okay, if it's a CQ DX, if I get on and I do whether it's in code or whether I do it on, on, on voice uh, or whether I do it on keyboards now, we do message packeting. You know, there are guys in ham radio that, that love to play with moon bounds. They love to to bounce the signals off the moon. Uh, and, and, and there are ham radio satellites that we get. Uh, NASA, we've got ham radio operators that are aboard, and we've got a ham radio station on the space station. And we launched satellites both from the space station and from the shuttle and from rockets. There are ham radio satellites. Frequently, they're called OSCAR. Orbit, orbital Satellite Carrying Amateur Radio, O-S-C-A-R, Oscar satellites. And we like to use those for communications and navigation and things like that. So there's a lot of different interests with it in ham radio. If I call CQDX, whether it's in code or in voice, it means I'm looking for a brief encounter, if you'll pardon the expression, like the one-nighter. You know, a guy in a bar looking for a one-nighter. Wants to hook up, thank you, wham, bam, thank you, and gone. Uh, okay, good. I talked, and we we send out other ham radio operators go nuts. So they spend their whole year planning for their vacation to take some ham radio equipment and wind generators and solar generators and land on some little piece of rock in the middle of an ocean and stay there for three days, making as many con quick contacts as they can, so that the other guy can say, "I worked that rock." <laughs> I talked to that rock on the day those guys were there. Nobody lives there. Nobody's ever there. But two guys went there for a week, and I talked to them. That's so, so it's just it's it's just kind of like the mystique or the prestige of it, like for a lot of people, it's about performance, the challenge, whatever. There are other guys that get on, and they get on regularly. We have what we call nets networks. Uh, there are guys that are out, you know, sailing on boats that have a ham radio aboard. They check in periodically and, and, and with nets and on schedules just so that everybody can tr keep track of everybody. And when you don't check into a net, uh, it might, after a couple of days, especially raise an alarm flag. A friend of mine who is known to some in, the, in our community of sound was Bill Mayhew. He had a little wireless mic business in, in Burbank and rent mostly renting and also selling wireless mics. He was a ham radio operator and he used to check in uh, with a bunch of guys every evening or twice a week, whatever it was. And they would just talk for an hour or so, you know, people all over the country and, our, and or all over the world. Just uh, what's going on? Oh, it's my anniversary coming up. My kid's going to school, such and such. Hey, you know what? All just talk it. We called it rag chewing, just chewing the rag. And when Bill Mayhew failed to check in, somebody sent out the alarm and they went and found that he had died. Oh, I mean, just from the social aspect of ham radio operator. True, a lot of people today are, are getting into these things on the internet and on their devices. But I guess that's what it was for us back then. Are there, are there still a lot of ham radio, ham radio operators and shortwave stuff going on today, or is it just all moved online? Yeah, it's, it's no, no, it's, it's still there. Ham radio operators, now our big thing is radios that we control. If I, I can arrange to put a radio in a better place for antenna, depending on what frequencies and things, you know, I'm involved in. You know, and then I set up a way that I can use Wi-Fi to get on the Internet to talk to my radio, which is on the Internet, so that it will relay my messages through ham radio. So there's a lot of Internet interconnectivity uh, for, for the lazy people. Uh, if you go in the ham radio books, there are uh, all sorts of USB attachments for your computer that will read Morse code and, and give you a... Uh, uh, you know, an LED screen of what's coming across in Morse code. So you can, there are now what they call uh, SDRs, software 
derived or driven radios where you buy the radio technology and you plug it into a USB slot and the computer does all of the using digital uses all of the uh, technology to literally go through the spectrum and find the signals and display pictures of the signals and decode the signals into audio or pictures. We have ham radio uh, TV. Uh, even when I was a kid, we had slow scan TV. Now, sure, you and I are doing the modern version of it right now. Right. Uh, back in, in, uh, in uh, the 1950s and 60s, you know, I could get on with a guy uh, on the other side of town or maybe a guy in western Pennsylvania. Uh, interesting side note, when I think of western Pennsylvania, I think of uh, Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> which was, by the way, originally called Night of the Flesh Eaters, which was put together in the 19, was in the 1950s. George Romero was a guy from Pittsburgh who put that all together. Yeah. Uh, as, as a movie, it, you know, and he made a boo-boo. He, he, his original title was Night of the Flesh Eaters, and that was copyrighted. Uh. When they changed it to Night of the Living Dead, didn't change, update the copyright. Night of the Living Dead has always been public domain. Jesus, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Would have made, could have, would have, should have made a lot of money on that. Yeah. Because of a copyright error. I tell that now, bringing, the, I, I love to do this when I can. I keep bringing this back around. I would tell my students, remember, when I was teaching sound, most of the classes I taught, I was teaching people who were in a movie school that wanted to be directors, writers, maybe producers, DPs, maybe editors, maybe combinations of that. They weren't there to be sound people. But I like to think, fortunately, most of these schools had a requirement for a sound class. So I developed my curriculum to be sound for movie school students what you need to know if you're going to be a movie maker and believe me uh and, and i know of all of the things we did cover we managed to leave out you know days and days worth of other conversations about how when i i was living in hawaii and started working tv show would come over like Magnum PI would come over and shoot in Hawaii and I would get involved. Maybe I'd get, get involved uh, by Entertainment Tonight would hire me and a cameraman. Actually, they'd hire the cameraman and me and we'd go to, to Magnum PI because they'd arranged a set visit or they'd arranged an interview. I remember getting calls from advertising agencies who found me and directors that, that said, I, I remember one case because I just saw the guy on TV last night in a movie in an episode of MASH, in fact. James Karen, an actor, he was a spokesperson for a chain of supermarkets someplace. His advertising agency called me and said, Mike, Bad Man Michael's days, can you go out? Our, our guy has got a, a guest role on Magnum PI this week, and we need him to record some, some copy because the prices have changed or some such excuse. <laughs> so, I'd have to make arrangements and go out. And, and it, what happened was, as I was doing all this stuff, it was kind of late in the game. I'm not farting. Honest, I'm not farting. Um, <laughs> and I even bought my own Nagra. And, and frankly, it was ill-timed. I spent $8,000 on a Nagra 4.2. And it was like the following year that I met Manfred Clem at NAB show or whatever, and we started talking about it, and, and I said, well, I've got, got to get this time code. And sure enough, the kind of calls I would get, being the guy in Hawaii, were I get a lot of calls for music videos that would come to Hawaii and shoot. And music videos were an early adopter of time code. Because every playback, you'd take a picture of the time code slate showing the playback time code, so that the film, could be related to the playback tape. 
All right. And I figured out I, I've got to get time code, got to get a slate, which meant, of course, got to buy Comtech's. Right. I mean, you know how that, you see how that goes. So I bought my first Nagra really late in the game. And, and ultimately, I didn't get it. I don't think I got its money's worth out of it because time code Nagras came along. And by 1989, you know, I was going, hey, I can't back up a time code Nagra with a non time code Nagra. It doesn't work. The people who need time code, you know, they, if I say, well, but I've got a Nagra 4.2, they said, we, that's not going to work for our workflow. Pardon me, workflow back in 1988. Right. And we're talking workflow. So I ended up not only being the guy in Hawaii who had the time code Nagra, I was the guy in Hawaii who also had the backup because when you live in Hawaii, you can't call location sound and send a driver. Right. Wow. You got to have another one handy in the state. So even if I didn't carry it with me every day, I always had that second time code Nagra. And then I start working for the TV and movies that are coming over. One of my mentors, I, I, uh, one of many men who I love and who is a great mentor to me, Keith Wester, big time A-list mixer, calls me up. Mike, uh, I'm, I'm going to be doing this movie. We're coming to Hawaii. Can you work with me? Joe versus the volcano. I saw that in the theater. Mabe <laughs> <laughs> Hushala. <laughs> oh wow yeah uh, Hal Whitby uh, who actually also was very instrumental in getting me on Baywatch Baywatch was Hal Whitby's show another, another man I loved and miss Hal Whitby was a surfer and you know he loved Hawaii and he loved coming to Hawaii he came to Hawaii on a show where he was Joe Kenworthy's boom man. I think it was called, uh, oh, Hawaiian Blue, something like that. It was a short-lived uh, cop show uh, that was filmed in Hawaii. Joe Kenworthy was the mixer. Hal Whitby came to town uh, as the boom operator on that show. And, uh, you know, they, I'm working and I'm, I'm making friends with these guys from the mainland. When I get called in, you know, they, they would call the big deal in Hawaii, in the Hawaii local, the biggest deal was if you got to be the utility technician on, on Hawaii 5 0, later Magnum PI. You know, that was like the, the local Hawaii mixer would, would give up. You know, right? Because they they would bring out the mixer from L.A. and the and the mixer brought the boom operator, and the concession was, "We'll hire the utility technician locally." Right. By the way, where Susan Chong came from. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know Susan. A respected mixer. Yeah. She was here after tour of duty. She had worked on the pilot for tour of duty. Another show I watched as a kid. <laughs> and and I had some work on tour of duty too. Uh, they hired her as the mixer after she worked on the pilot. I did some work on the series while she was the mixer, and I did some second unit. I also did some set visits by Show Light Entertainment Tonight. When Tour of Duty said, we're moving back to the mainland, Susan Chong said, here's my move. She's been here ever since and been working very successfully. She got an Emmy nomination for the original season of Tour of Duty. I remember it well. Uh, I was in Seoul, South Korea, working for NBC at the Olympics. And I remember when the nominations were announced. It was August. That was when the Olympics were in 88. And I was in Seoul, Korea. When I heard about it, uh, I managed to use, we had, interesting kind of stuff because i was working for nbc i you know not movies but we had a uh, t uh, on a t1 that we had back to the mainland we had a telephone extension from burbank <laughs> that i could literally pick up and dial 818 numbers as a local oh wow 
I would dial 9 and the 818 number so that I could call and congratulate Susan Chong nice. on her Emmy nomination. Emmy, not just, not even a local Emmy. This is an Emmy nomination, Susan. Hawaii has gone big time. <laughs> and you are the face of it, the person of it. She, so, she was super nice. She had come in a couple times when I was working at Coffee Sound. I think she... I, if I'm trying to remember, I can't remember if she bought a diva from me, but she worked on the TV show, The Young Riders. Young Riders in Arizona. And, and she she mentioned, you know, you know how Marley Matten show was that Marley Matten uh, and a, and a Mark Hamill show at Warner Brothers. Young Riders. She was in Arizona for a couple of seasons of that. Yeah, she she mentioned, you know, how like sound mixers, you know, you mentioned shows in passing that you've done and. Well, I mean, so this is like probably oh three or oh four or oh five somewhere in there, and she's she mentioned about being on the Young Riders, and I'm like, oh my gosh, my sister who's three years older than me back when that show was on was a huge fan of the show, and you know I I mentioned that you know in passing, and then a couple weeks later she comes in, and she's got a hat from production, you know, says the Young Riders, you know, ball cap. She says, here, this is all I, you know, I really didn't have much left, but I thought your sister might like this. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so thoughtful and so sweet. Yeah. I said it to my sister. My sister was like floored by it. She says, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Susan's such a, she's good people. Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen her in a long time. So she came out of Hawaii. Oh, I didn't know she was originally in Hawaii. And, and it was like just a couple of years later and the same thing happened to me. I literally got pulled out of Hawaii because I was making friends like Keith Wester and Hal Whitby and David Ronnie, uh, you know, and, and these were, you know, in, in many cases, these were like the A-list heavy hitter mixers doing the, the big pictures, Richard Lightstone. I met Jeff Wexler in Hawaii. He was doing Slow Mama from the train and they brought me over and I did some work on that with him. Uh, so, I kind of got pulled over to Hawaii in that time period. But yeah, I was the guy with not just a time code Nagra, but, and, and that's a big lesson you learn when you live in Hawaii. You got to have backup. Yeah. You have a plan B. And it's got to be a plan B that'll work. Like I said, the Nagra 4.2 was a gorgeous machine. It, it ended up having very few hours on it. But, you know, it was just, Poor timing because I ended up buying. And by the way, I bought Nagra timecode Nagras when they were pricey, when the dollar was in bad shape and the Swiss franc was fairly strong. So I paid some some good prices for them. But you got to have the right tools, and your tools are what you need. I get you know now. Let's bring it around again so that it's relevant. So people would have been looking for the little gems. We got a period going on right now. We're losing. The use, because the way the government's decided to work things now, it'll change. You know, I remember when the government was going to save us from <laughs> the monopoly of AT and T. Right. Yeah. After they created the monopoly. Monopoly. Yeah. <laughs> and who is look at all the, the permutations we've gone through now, and now we're fighting AT and T. And we're, we've lost it, some of our 600 megahertz spectrum that we have been accustomed to utilizing has been taken over, uh, money grubbed away, the government, you know. And, and I look at the results of this auction and I say, oh, yeah, they claim how much money they're making. You know, they make enough money on, on this 100 megahertz of spectrum to finance the war in Afghanistan for, what, two days? Yeah, it's it's tough, it, and it's for the national budget. But it, it's 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 tough for for folks that are buying equipment. You know, I'm encountering this now. You know, someone calls up and they want to quote, "Oh yeah, I want to get you know Electro L series in like the C range," because they have like A, B, and C. They're like wide band now, and um, I'm like, well, you know about those those free like those frequencies, right? And they're like, no, I'm like in a year, year and a half, they're gone. You're not gonna be able to. Well, I mean they'll exist, but, but yeah, you're not going to be able to use them legally. The like, new oh. are taking possession right now. Yeah. So it's, it's just like, 
and it's frustrating. You know, people have equipment in those ranges and it's like, well, Electro may be able to refreak them or, you know, Sennheiser, the other manufacturers may be able to refrequency them. But the good news is all of the manufacturers realize and, and you know, this is the, the good news, is the bad news, but they are trying to make somewhat enticing offers of trade-ins. Yeah. And I think pretty much all the major players have got those trade-ins available. That's got, that's, they got to be taking a hit on that. You know, it's not yeah. cheap to do that. They are, you know, but, you know, it's like, it's like the, uh, in, in my heritage, we come from the, hey, I'm losing money on every sale, but I'm going to make it up on volume. Yeah. You know, they understand the issue and they want to encourage their customers to, to do the right thing and they hope that, you know, even if we don't, if we skinny down a lot of our margins, we'll make it up on the volume. Yeah. We're not going to lose money on every sale, but they, you know, uh, but this is a, a, a very frustrating time. And it was a, a friend of mine uh, who I, I like to think I've been a mentor to just recently said, wow, I realized that I've got six systems. I've got eight systems and six of them are above 600 megahertz. What do I, what, what can I do? Well, the odds, you know, I got, I've got to tell you as at the risk of my FCC licenses, and I have several of them, station licenses. I have commercial radio operator licenses, which allow me to tune up radios and transmitters and, and design them and test them and, and all that. I have, I have the wireless mic licenses, station licenses. Those are station licenses. Those aren't really operator licenses. Uh, those license you to have and utilize the equipment. That doesn't, by the way, and having an FCC station license for your wireless does not actually authorize you to, to tweak the innards. Oh. Uh, the, the people at the factory that do that have commercial licenses. They have technician licenses. Anyhow. Uh, yeah, what what can you do? Uh, some of the stuff on 700 megahertz is still being used today. Yeah. <laughs> it's still being used. And like I said, our wireless microphones are pretty low power. And by design, whether your producer thinks it should go five miles, you know, for a reality show or not. By design, these microphones are designed and purposed and licensed and, and described in the licensing papers. The whole thing is based on short range, limited uh, capabilities, which cause limited amounts of interference. And if you're using these wireless microphones and you're not interfering with anybody, what can I say as a person? Yeah. As a salesperson for somebody who's got a, a, a business stock in it, you know, has to say, these are no longer legal after next April. You're going to have to deal with that. I have to be careful, but I'm probably in a little safer position to say, it ain't broken. You might not have to fix it. But I also had clients in Las Vegas. This was interesting. Now we're going, how many years was it that they eliminated analog TV? Oh, geez. Uh, it's been, you know, seems like only yesterday. Yeah, and but it's four years before that, the FCC gave every broadcaster a second station license for their digital. So every broadcaster, every television station had an analog license and a digital license. In every city, they had two channels. And then ultimately, they finally came up with the cutoff day, and then they extended it. And then they I remember it. all that. Yeah, they I remember that. I remember they turned out the analog stations, and only the digital ones stayed on. Meanwhile, I'm going back to when the digital stations, the whole idea was the analog stations can start getting their equipment. They can start, you know, buying and testing their equipment. They can fire it up. They can make their signal measurements, which are part of what the FCC calls for broadcasters, your proof of performance. Because when, you, when the FCC gives you a license to use the people's airwaves, 
They expect you to serve the people and that you have to prove that you, your equipment actually does put a signal out there that the people can get. Proof of performance. So the TV stations, the digital stations, started coming on. And I had, I had wireless mics that I had sold or, and or installed or been involved in the, the installations of in places like the Venetian. The, the big shopping, the, the Venice thing in Las Vegas. Right. I get a call one day from an engineer who I knew from the hotel where I take care of their sound systems. And he called me up. He said, I got your number from, from Jim at the Fremont. You know, I used to work there. Yeah, yeah. How you doing? Fine. I'm at the Venetian now. We got a problem. I think you can help. What's the problem? Our wireless mic stopped working. I said, well, well, it works, but it doesn't work. Well, <laughs> that's I love that one. <laughs> well, when we turn it on and test it, it works. But then when we try to use it, it doesn't work. But if we bring it back over and, turn, and try to test it, it's working again. In other words, their range was down to 15 feet. Yeah. This was not a first for me. Going back again, uh, and this was in the same period of time, uh, going back again. No, maybe not. Maybe this was even before in the analog days. I'm doing a basketball tournament on Maui, and, I, and I'm doing radio broadcasts. And it, it, it turned out these basketball tournaments, companies like Learfield that had rights to several stations, Learfield would call me up, and they'd say, uh, we need you to cover three different teams in this 12-team tournament or whatever it was. Because, you know, they didn't want to send over three engineers. Uh, and the TV, the, the basketball team brought a videographer from the TV station, local TV station, to do double duty because they wanted game shots and the TV station wanted interviews for, from this tournament in Hawaii. Wow, our team, you know, from, from uh, Alabama or Kansas KU was going all the way. Uh, Gonzaga, I remember. I'm not a big sports fan. Gonzaga, what the heck is Gonzaga? This is college, my God. Uh, and, it, and they're good at basketball. Who knew? Uh, and so we're doing the radio broadcasts, and this guy comes up, and he's got electrosonics receiver on his camera, and he's put electrosonics transmitter on my radio broadcast equipment because he wants the audio from the radio play-by-play -play to be the soundtrack for his game shot so that when they look at it to study it, they can know what was going on by the play-by-play. -play. Unfortunately, he puts it on and it works. And then he goes out and he starts shooting and he's got no audio. And yes, so this goes back a ways. It, he had, it wasn't variable frequency. Yes, fixed frequencies. It was still crystal controlled fre fixed frequency. The transmitter transmitted on one frequency and the receiver received on that frequency. And as was very common in those days, where did people put their wireless microphones? Unused TV channels. Well, that was an unused TV channel back in his hometown back there in Kansas. But not in Hawaii. Right here on Maui, we, we're, and we're right at the base of the mountain that's got that big old TV transmitter, and he's wiped out. Yeah. Okay, same thing had happened. A digital TV station had just come on in Las Vegas to start their testing and wiped out a bunch of wireless mics that the performers were using at the Venetian. But they were frequency agile by that point. I mean, they didn't just... Well, yes. And at that point, it was a frequency agile system. And I had to, to, to I got to charge them, I don't remember, a couple hundred bucks. But I re-coordinated and re-freaked a whole bunch of frequencies for it. Yeah. Because, because now... they have their own AV guy. You know, you get some companies have an AV guy that'll know this stuff. And a lot of companies don't. You know, it, you get a church and they've got two wireless mics and they know they put batteries in them, they turn them on and they work. One day it doesn't work, you know, 
and their guy might be what they call a Gazinta engineer. Have you ever run across Gazinta engineers? I, I know the name goes into goes out there this goes into here and that goes into there and if yeah. it doesn't work it goes into the shop yeah yeah i it's but it's so like nowadays like the even the lower cost like the um this g3s the Sennheiser g3s they frequency scan you see it on the little screen and uh like here where i live i'm in middle tennessee and we're kind of way out here in the country you know i do a frequency scan and there's nothing so i could Blast away all day. I'm clear. Right. Um, and, and you're liable to find out there that your 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 six systems uh, up in 600 megahertz are still working next summer. Probably. And uh, on the other hand, you you you're in a position where do you want to keep them and maybe add some new systems? Do you want to take advantage of the trade in uh, slash rebate offers? Uh, and be legal, especially if you're licensed. You know, the good side of being licensed is you, you, you're part of a group that has a, a standing. The bad news is, uh, as part of the terms of your license, you have to accept the rules, whether you read them or not, they apply to you. Yeah. You're, you're considered responsible for knowing, constructive notice again. Uh, so, yeah, what, what on earth do we do? Uh, it's we're in a rough spot now uh, but and I'm going back a little bit here you got to understand that if you're in this as a business that change progress these are things that are built in they're not things to be avoided or feared you know you got to welcome them and if you're really trying to do this as as your livelihood as, as your advocation as your vocation you got to understand that periodically something's going to smack you in the face and say uh need to spend some money you need to spend some money here you know it's it's like i would tell people you know when when they would say what's wrong with it and i'd say just a guess it's broken <laughs> you know and if it's broken you got two choices Right. You could say more. Replace it or fix it. Yeah. Or do without whatever it was. Or maybe you didn't need it or something like that. But the bottom line is, you know, you got to figure that if you had these wireless mic, okay, if you bought 600 megahertz, uh, like I said, how long ago was it that they took away 700 megahertz? How many years ago was that? A couple of years ago. I don't know exactly. I don't remember exactly how long. Mm -hmm. Well, you should have gotten your money's worth out of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you haven't gotten your money's worth out of them, then maybe you don't need them that much. In other words, you got six 600 megahertz system, and if you can't look at me and say, well, I've got my money's worth out of it, then maybe you haven't been using them very much. I was just at a casino because I, that's what one of the things that I haven't completely retired from. Like I said, I told you earlier, you know, with the calls, I had to go to Las Vegas. They were having some issues and they said, well, no, and we got something that's coming up that this has got to be fixed by. So uh, we'd like you to come out right away. They know but they're a great client. I love them. It's been a long, long relationship, but I go out there and I'm, and I'm tweaking around on a couple of things and I find this Bogan, PA amplifier and it it sounds crappy is an understatement <laughs> it's it sounds like uh like it's got laryngitis laryngitis just fuzzy growly kind of sound to it and i go in the back and i see what's there and then i i touch the controls and as i touch the controls I hear this humongous crackling noise coming. Oh my gosh. You know, the people outside are screaming because the noise is so loud. And, and you know, and I'm going, oh. and you know, this amplifier is from the 1980s. And I, I said to him, we don't fix this. <laughs> we've gotten your money's worth look at the layer of dust on top of this to 
the dust is in the knobs and and it's tired it's old it's been on powered on sitting here working for 30 years you've got your money's worth out of it and 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 i'm having to tell these same casinos that wireless microphone systems that were put in in the early 2000s now have to be replaced and you've got to put it in your budget you know if you don't want to do it now put it in next year's budget because you got the time you got till next april but you got to plan on replacing these wireless microphones because you as a business don't want to turn you know find out one day that you know verizon is has clobbered you and you can no longer communicate uh you know in the case of tony roma's restaurant you can no longer communicate uh slip 61 your table is ready come back to tony roma's because verizon has decided this afternoon to turn on their new equipment and claim their frequencies yeah so you got to budget these things it's business it's life it goes on what you will get will be better and what you will get may not last forever i can tell you from my painful experience that i bought and i can go back to my ham radio days when i first was getting licensed and i i happened to buy and build a very good and it was a good value and it was an excellent transmitter i bought uh it was called a heat kit apache and it, it had a lot of all kinds of stuff that i want it did both code and voice but it did a, a type of voice transmission called am which is in fact technically the same as am radios which is am radio stations but i got it built and came on the air and got my general license and suddenly the air is filled with strange duck like sounding strange wah, 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 transmissions called single sideband carrier suppressed SFP. <laughs> and suddenly am transmitters with their power hungry carriers using up not only electricity i mean if i wanted to put 200 watts out on the air on voice i had to have 200 watts for the carrier and another 200 watts for the for the voice for the modulation so i'm i'm using 500 600 watts out of the plug and it's being replaced by this much more efficient new system that we're all adopting called ssb single sideband carrier suppressed it takes up much less spectrum and remember i was using all kinds of spectrum but i was in block one and fortunately there there was i could buy at the time an adapter that would plug in and i could rewire my apache and make some changes and this adapter unit that ended up sitting between the transmitter and the receiver allowed my am transmitter to broadcast single sideband carrier suppressed i mean this was a unit that was as technically uh complex as the as the transmitter and modulator and everything else were to begin with it was a whole nother thing nowadays we buy things that are the size of our laptop computers and look what they do it's yeah. all gonna change people deal with it yeah it's it's and the, the thing is i think that's frustrating for some people nowadays is it changes so fast you know the the nagra you look at like just film sound the nagra was the standard for years and years and years and years and then so when i bought my first nagra i expected years right. and years and years and yet two years later i was buying a time code nagra and you know it was nice that i had the 4.2 but you know i was getting you know big deal 25 dollars 50 dollars versus 75 dollars or, or then I raised it to a hundred, but we're talking back in what nineteen eighty three or 83. right. That was the, like your daily rental that you were charging on there, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I remember, and and another another legend, Courtney Gooden taught me something. Yeah, Courtney Gooden didn't buy Timecode Nagra. 
he rented it. He would rent the time code Nagra, but he bought the slates. Now, Courtney, at that time, in particular, in, in the uh, late 80s, was doing tons and tons and tons and tons of commercials. And commercials, along with music videos, were early adopters of time code. They wanted that time code at the front so they could transfer the film directly to video and edit it in video using time code, which is what time code was designed for by Simpy. So Courtney says, I can get $75 for the, for the time code Nagra, and, and I got location sound, uh, which was then LSC, Audio Services Corporation at the time. Audio Services Corporation will rent me a Nagras as a, as a you know mixer preferred customer for fifty dollars. So I only make twenty five dollars on the Nagra, but Nagras cost fourteen thousand dollars. He says a slate cost me fifteen hundred dollars, and I get fifty dollars a day for it. He <laughs> bought slates. Yeah, it it was. I mean, you. I remember I sold a couple of like when I was at coffee, and that, that's people. You know, it was the Diva 2s. You know, we would do complete packages, like, built from the ground up uh, that were, like, you know, $100,000, $120,000 for everything. Yeah. And and it's just, like, nowadays, I would be reluctant to do that. Because at least with the Diva 2, it still had a lot of life left in it. And Glenn was doing... Um, trades of people that had recently bought a diva 2 when the Which, fours and fives came away a couple of my schools been, that was when i met colleen i had met glenn and uh, colleen had not started uh becoming a uh, as thoroughly involved spokesperson uh, executive of the company uh she was kind of running the company so glenn says call up colleen and uh, tell her i said to talk to her and he he and colleen then organized sending me a couple of the trade-ins for my schools to use. Oh, nice. Isn't that a nice Zaxcom story? Yeah. So that we could, we could start showing our students the, the new stuff long before our schools would spend the money. I mean, our schools, you know, this goes back to, because I know you wanted to talk about my teaching. And I started to say, I was teaching sound for, for people who wanted to be in the movie business but weren't going to be sound people. And this is about what does the, the, the storyteller need to know about sound so that they can do their job as a storyteller. And, you know, I, I, I would try to explain to them that, that it isn't automatic. Uh, you know, with camcorders starting to come out, uh, when I started teaching, we had to teach all the movie students how to run a Nagra. And that was a big part of the semester, was every student had to personally be able to, the midterm exam was to take a Nagra out of its case, prep it, put a tape on it, record something, rewind it, and play it back. That was the midterm. Wow, I would have aced your midterm. <laughs> yeah, but would that make any sense now? But it was very equipment-centric, and that was because back in those days, if you wanted to make a movie, there was only one way to do sound. You know, people could go crazy, I want to shoot in 16 millimeter. No, no, I want to shoot on 35, even if it means using short ends and getting one take per, per film roll change. You know, all this stuff that students were doing but if you wanted to do sound you had to have a nagra and tape and so i started off teaching that well as we started getting away now there's a lot of different solutions for doing sound for your movie yeah but and 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 they're accessible to anybody they're easily accessible the nagra was special you couldn't the manual didn't tell you how to use it, and you couldn't figure it out. I'm sorry. People did not self-learn the Nagra. We all got taught by somebody. The what's and the why's and the how's of that crazy machine. And then once we knew it, by the way, 
for some of us, we had a marketable skill. Uh, now that's changing. I, I, I'm talking about the early 90s, and this is all changing. And, and so many other things are becoming accessible. You know, the, one of the early big things was when people started getting these Hi8 cameras. Is that what it was, Hi8? Mini yeah. DV. And then came Hi, Mini DV. Mini DV it, was next, camera, yeah. Canon, what was the funny looking Canon? The, the XL1. XL1, oh wow, I'm shooting this on the XL1. Steven Soderbergh shot a movie on an XL1. <laughs> well, yeah, you can make great images. And, and the story I tell, which is, which is a, a, just the example, was of this one student I had. So this goes back early when I was teaching and, and, and working at, at a couple of schools. And this student, who was a pretty good student and, and very dedicated, very uh, hard charging, uh, you know, motivated student. And uh, she, you know, wanted to make a movie and she, she got an XL, she bought an XL camera. And she, of course, writer, director, producer, star. Uh, <laughs> way too many jobs for one person on your first movie ever. I'm yeah. sorry. Way too many jobs. Somebody's smoking something strange here if you think you can do all that and do any of it well. Uh, but she's going to do this. And she goes out and she puts a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of money into it she took a couple of uh, cinematography classes and uh, and she spent time and she did a few things right uh not not always not enough but you know uh way too much handheld you know people don't understand uh by the way i'm looking at your picture and you ought to adjust your camera you got a, a bit too much headroom but I guess with the mic it's okay but you know <laughs> all these all these beginners kinds of things right and she goes out and she shoots this movie and spends a lot of time and and buys and rents props i think she paid some location fees you know she got all of her friends and family involved you know and uh, and then she edits oh yeah oh final cut pro edits the movie and uh, her instructor, who interestingly taught at two of the schools that I taught at. So we were both, J JP and I were both at Los Angeles City College and Arts Center. And I can't remember now which school this was at, but uh, she finished editing and you know, cut her film. And JP says, okay, well, now you got to take care of the sound. Go talk to Senator. And so she brings me the movie and I say, okay, well, let's go see it. And we sit down to, to watch her movie. You know, this would be like the very initial spotting session. Right. You know, and what are we going to do about all, all sorts of stuff? I mean, this is, this is just brand spanking new. And she plays me her movie and all of the sound on it is from a camera mic. No, oh, jeez. <laughs> The XL1 camera mic. That's good enough, right? Well, you know, uh, my, the guy, my DP said he could hear it all. When we were shooting, I'd, I'd ask him, I said, can you hear it? And he'd say, yeah, I can hear it. Oh, yeah. But, you know, the only shot where the sound was any good was this one. You know, the ECU where you're cutting off the forehead and you're cutting off the chin. The sound was great for, for those few shots. Everything else, it sounded like a camera mic. Got to loop the whole thing. You got to. <laughs> I hope you have budget for post, post sound. Got to loop well, the whole thing. So what I would try in my sound classes my philosophy was, I want to, want to be sure to lay this out somewhere in this extended thing, is what do the, 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 does the movie maker, the storyteller, what they ought to know, and, and, and maybe a few tips. And that was how I taught my classes. I got into 
some discussions with uh, a department chair who I will not name. Uh, and I haven't had that many department chairs and I got along better with most of them, but, and, and I thought okay with this one, but I kept having to fight this same fight until finally I decided I didn't need to fight the fight anymore with losing battle because I was trying to teach the, the movie makers not how to use a Zoom F4, which by the way, or was it a Zoom? The H4N? H4N, good, yeah. The, the F series of Zooms are, are actually significantly better recorders, but this was the Zoom H4. And the school had decided that it was a lot cheaper to buy these than it was to buy the Fostex FR, what was it, FR2s? The FR2 and the FR2 LE, yeah. Yeah, the FR2s particularly, not the FR2 LE, because uh, I got, my schools were using FR2s with the time code adapter, and I want to tell you something, aside from battery life, that was a killer machine. Those were really cool. And if you used external batteries and you had the time code, code adapter, that machine was one heck of a value. Yeah. They were, I've used them for sound effects recording back in the day, and then the FR2 LE also for sound effects recording. Well, you know, you could get the FR2 with the time code adapter and a slate. And you had, I mean, you had the, the pre-roll, you had everything. And it was reasonably priced. And it was, like I said, the only drawback was batteries. You had, a, you had to carry an external backpack to be any good. Uh, in the field, but you know, so I would spend a couple of sessions. I would bring the FR2 in and give everybody a chance to to play with it a little bit. I demonstrate the pre-record feature, explain to them how it was a time machine, and so on and so forth. And you know, I get comments coming back from from the department chair saying, you know, you're not really teaching them recording. I need you to be recording production sound in every class. Record production sound in every class. Now, I'm putting this out there here, folks. I'm, I'm looking for answers for how to do this. You got a class of 16 people in a limited amount of equipment, especially when, when the equipment that I have to use for the class is the same equipment that students check out to do their own projects on. So it's not even always there. And you don't have like, you know, you got 10 students in the class, but you don't have 10 packages. Right. Besides, uh, so I'm trying to teach students things like, you need a boom operator. If you're doing a movie and you're not real experienced, you're, you know, and you get people, all your friends and family that want to help, you know, don't pick some kid and say, oh, you can be the boom operator. Find somebody who's done some sound on movies, let them be the boom operator. You know, I got a lot of people that would call me and say, we need a good production mixer because I don't have any money and I sure won't have any money in post because you know they're gonna go over budget in production anyhow, let alone have money in post. You know, so I need a good sound mixer so that I, I, I can get it. And I explained to them, you don't need a good sound mixer. You need a good boom operator. Yeah. And let your friend or your cousin or your nephew or, or whoever the heck it is, let them push the button and watch the winky blinky lights. <laughs> you need somebody who knows about getting the boom into where it needs to be and, and dealing with the shadows. I said, you need to do blocking rehearsals. And you need, I tell you what, this is one of the biggest tips that I, you know, I'm surprised the movie schools aren't teaching this. None of the classes are teaching this. Get some of these volunteers to be stand-ins. Yeah. How, how many of these no budget productions and or first time directors, you go on the set and they say, well, okay, here's what's gonna happen. They're gonna walk in over there and they're gonna move over there and they sit down here and talk. And I say, well, can we, can we get the actors and block it out and, and you know, go through the lines and see where they're gonna do what and when, you know? Well, no, 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 the, the actors are in makeup. 
and then they got hair and wardrobe and we won't have the actors yet it'll be another hour or so but we're going to go ahead and get ready and then yeah yeah we'll do a rehearsal before we shoot invariably an hour and a half later when the actors finally come out that's now followed up with ready for this phrase folks we may get lucky let's shoot it <laughs> let's shoot the rehearsal we may get it's not a rehearsal if you shoot the rehearsal <laughs> it's not a rehearsal and by the way that luck doesn't happen but get stand-ins block your shots and i've seen this even on bigger sets i mean I, I was on a set once that had enough money that there was actually a bonding company that sent out a guy to oversee it because the production was going so far south. And the, the, product, the guy from the bonding company, every day when he'd come on the set, he'd come over to me to look at my log. And he'd look at my log for the takes and the time codes. He'd see where things were going from that. Yeah. You know, and they, they get this thing where they say, well, are the actors... You know, sometimes they'd have a seven o'clock call and they'd give the actors a nine o'clock call because they figured they're going to need some time to dress the sets and everything. Okay, now I understand about that. And even on major productions, I've been on, on shows where they build whole sets like on uh, The Shadow. Remember that movie? Yeah, not a lot of people do. Alec Baldwin remembers The Shadow and Jonathan Winters. What a guy. Okay, uh, and uh, they built this nightclub set called The Cobalt Club. You know, and it was a whole sound stage at Universal, and they built it, and they spent weeks building it. And so, yeah, we got to go visit it. But the day, the day when we came in to shoot, yeah, they they didn't come out at seven o'clock and do a blocking rehearsal, but they did come out at about nine o'clock or nine thirty and did a blocking rehearsal. And then Alex and Jonathan went back to hair wardrobe and makeup while we had stand-ins. So you know what's going on, and your boom operator, you can make decisions about wireless mics or not wireless mics. And of course, another big fallacy that used to be, it's not as much anymore, it used to be, well, I can't afford wireless mics. And wireless mics became a financial decision instead of a creative decision. And now wireless mics have become a creative decision, but in the wrong way, because now the creative people just say, Put wireless mics on everybody. We'll get everything, and that's it. Gone too far the other way, folks. But I kept trying to teach my people, pick your locations wisely. You know, take your sound person on the scout and try to listen to them. Now, I understand I'm not going to, if I go on scouts, I'm not going to win every battle for location because it's a noisy location. But at least I'm going to tell you to be prepared for the fact that there are going to be issues. Yeah. I would tell my students the story about the time, first day on a, on a show. I hadn't been on the location scout. First day out, 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm putting together my cart. The, hair, the wardrobe is over there in a the trailer. The, the burritos are over there at the catering truck. You know, hair, makeup, and wardrobe are all getting set up. I'm setting up at this location here in LA and I'm setting up my cart and, and, and the producer or the director, I forget which, is walking around being friendly, being encouraging, being upbeat, you know, nice person for, you know, going around, hey, how's everybody doing? Are we all right there? Naturally, when he comes to me setting up my cart, what do you think the question is? How's it sounding or how's it going to sound? How, how's it going to sound? Are we okay on sound? What do you think my answer is? It depends. <laughs> I got to tell you something. This goes back earlier than that. This is like in the late 80s. And it was before I had, I, I had learned or discovered it depends. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention that this, was, this house was at the end of a cul-de-sac. And it ended there because there was a freeway on the other side of the fence and an off-ramp. Uh, oh, you didn't have rush hour traffic yet. And here we are in the morning, and, and producer says, how, how are we doing for sound? And my answer is, well, I, I don't have any problems, you know, but this freeway is going to be in your movie. 
<laughs> it's a character now. It's in your movie. Now, and I, this is how I tried to present it to my students. Uh, certainly, when a great big 18-wheeler comes by, downshifting, going, burr, 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 we're going to have to do it again. You're going to want to do it again. On the other hand, a good part of the time, it's just going to be, I don't, way back, however long ago it was, I turned off, I had a little fan going here. You probably wouldn't have noticed it going in the background, but I turned it off because, you know, this way it's nice and quiet. Okay, you're going to have some traffic in the background. So it's going to be in your movie. Is that a, I don't have a problem with it. It's your problem. Right? Yeah. Now, if this is a movie, a Civil War movie. That's a problem. <laughs> it's a big problem. Yeah. If this is a movie, takes place in a location in a city, you'll you'll live with it. Yeah, I, I I've always recommended to people like, uh, you know, I'm on location right now, and we're doing a thing, and there's a str I remember there was one, there's a stream, like going by, and like there's like nothing we could do, like for the characters, you know, they're right next to it, and I go, you know, I don't know what your set dynamics are like. Just float the idea like, hey, just get an establishing shot of this little stream. Just so the audience knows this is there. See what happens. And, you know, a couple hours later after they wrap for the day, it's like, oh, yeah, they thought it was a great idea. And that's what they went with. And, um, yeah, God only knows if it made the final cut or not. But it was just like, well. <laughs> I, I have another story that could have been, as you were telling it, I was expecting this story. Because uh, in this story, uh, I, I credit to my friend Brooks. Because he was doing the show with somebody he had met through me at school. And, and he, at the time, also worked at the school, I think. Had worked there. Anyhow. And he goes out with this person. And they're shooting on location by a stream. And same thing, you know. This, you're going to hear this stream. And, and he says, well, that's okay. I want to hear the stream because it's supposed to be by a stream. Well, that's yeah. good. You know, and yeah, if you've got an establishing shot that shows you're by the stream, that's a start. But I said, what you do is, is you get your opening shot as a bigger shot. I also don't like the word wide so much as I like the word bigger shot. Get a bigger shot because we're talking more headroom. Wide shot is not headroom. Wide shot is left and right. You know, but you get a bigger shot, shows this beautiful scenic location. Then when you cut in for all the close shots, you go someplace quiet and shoot it. You, you shoot someplace where the, the stream is now 300 yards in the background. It still looks like that we're in the forest, but you don't hear the stream in the shot. You can always add the stream to the shot, but you can't take it away. away. Yeah. You can always, if you've got morning traffic when you shoot one angle and then you shoot in the afternoon and there's no traffic and, and you know, your location sounds that much different. These are the kinds of things that I tried to teach my movie students in the sound class. But, you know, how can you keep the meter, you know, how, how many flashes of the red light are acceptable? <laughs> Yeah, well, a lot of people don't realize. How can I teach a class how to do production sound? You know, I even floated the idea. I said, I tell you what, let me hold my class in the studio on, on the stage that the school has, you know, at the same time as the production class is shooting so that my students can do sound. That's the only way you're going to learn. My, my main assignments that I, I in, in trying to, to meet this mandate, I kept trying to send my students out. I say, your final term paper is to go out and work on a student project as the sound person. Sign up on this student project before they start shooting, not the night before. Right. And talk to them. Talk about the location. Now, think about what your problems are going to be. Then do the sound and then write the report, the after action report. And, and 
I could see from that report whether they had picked up the stuff I had been feeding them in the class. Because nowadays anybody can buy a recorder and the recorders are so darn cheap yeah. that yeah. you can even afford to buy it, use it. You know, when it, when it was a Nagra, you couldn't afford to buy a $7,000 Nagra to make your pet film. So you go out and you try to find somebody. You might even be willing to pay them uh, some rental you know, if they do the sound for free because they knew how to operate the machine. And besides that, they were afraid to let somebody that didn't know how to operate the machine operate their, their prized Nagra. Uh, nowadays, that's, that's not the hard part. The hard, hard part is understanding that sound is a partner in the storytelling. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, George Lucas said sound and, you know, music and sound is half the... Uh, um, you know, yeah. half the experience. I, I, hear, I hear that quote a lot, but I don't like to put a number on it. It's, it's something I learned long, 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 long time ago about real estate. It's a, uh, an undivided part of the whole. It's like condominiums. Uh, if you buy a condominium, you, you not only own your, depart, your, your own apartment in the condominium, but you own an undivided interest in all of the common areas. In other words, you can't say, well, I own the swimming pool and you own the barbecue. It's like we all own the swimming pool and the barbecue. And right. I, I believe that it's a partnership. And yeah, at some moments it may go one way and other moments it may go the other way. And silence or, or the unsound may also be a I mean, as a whole, but you know, other than, you know, wanting to quibble about, you know, whether it's 49 or 50 or 51%, you know, it's a partner in your storytelling and it's gotta be a partner from the very beginning. When you first start thinking about making this movie, whatever it is, when you start writing it, when you start saying, I'm going to direct it, you read the script, you got to start hearing it. And you got to start understanding about the factors that are, going to, that are going to make it sound the way you want it. And lastly, then you got to remember that even in documentary, that it's really about enhancing and making up what you need to to tell the story the way you want to tell it. Right. So. There's nothing I, you know, I had students at, at uh, uh, the Disney school up there uh, in Valencia, uh, Cal Arts. Mm -hmm. They would say, oh, you know, I want to get the organic sound. <laughs> I heard that so many times. I go, yes, that's not what you do in making movies. You make the organic sound and you make it what you want it to be. Yeah, I have a... I've dealt with a lot of that when I was first starting freelance doing sound editorial and sound design. And, oh, we recorded it to, and it's like, and, and then I would, and then here's, you know, how much do you charge? Like, I don't know. Let me, let me, I, I would usually do it per project when you first start now. And one of them, they would try to do that. And I was like, guys, we have to loop this entire thing. Luckily it was like only like a 10 minute short, but it was like, we have to, replace all this dialogue because you decided to do organic natural that none of it works yeah oh i i i had i had my my instance like that back in the, the late 80s one of the earlier projects when we first moved to uh, los angeles and i was actually sharing an office space with dean gilmore and blake wilcox and uh there was another office in the same little building and the guys come over and they want me to do sound for their movie. They've already figured out, though, you know, their sound design, you know, because they, they're going to get this dummy head and they're going to put it on the camera. Because dummy head sound, you know, with the... With oh, the binaural. Okay, yeah. Bin, binaural dummy head. And they're going to put it on top of the camera so that the sound will always be exactly what the camera hears. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But cameras don't hear anything. They shoot picture. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How did I do? Have I covered your, your the question? 
Yeah, yeah. You know, we could go, honestly, we could go even longer. Um, but it's like we're on three and a half hours almost. Um, well, you, you do edit? Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I may edit a little bit. Uh, but typically so far, like the ones that I've done, it's just I throw – a thing in the front like, up there and say watch it if you like it yeah i throw up, yeah I throw a front bumper on a rear and typically what i've done is uh like with jan and with mike i, I pull out little tidbits that are like oh here's like five minutes that's really cool or you know a little 10 minutes about certain things and then have them be separate so there's like here this is it's almost like a preview like a trailer like here's mm -hmm. You know, when Jan was talking about, you know, Sopranos or Mike was talking about, uh, you know, Walking Dead or Good Eats and, you know, so, but yeah. Can I, can I tell you how little we use wireless mics on the next generation? Uh, you know what? If we could, what, we need to do another one of these because you've got so much and um, I honestly didn't think we were going to go this long. How little we use wireless mics on Baywatch? Uh, like zero, right? Actually, in both cases, the answer is very, very little. Uh, and, and just to, to tease that, uh, on Baywatch, I did have uh, Maritza, our costume designer, uh, make me some pouches out of the same material as the bathing suits. Oh, that'll allow you to hide them easier. Exactly. See, to me, it's problem solving. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of a lot of production sound is problem solving and well, a lot. Just a few previews if anybody is still here and <laughs> come back for, for volume two. Yeah, yeah. I think I think in the next one we should talk more about like the practical side, like usage, like how this works, how to do that and why, you know. Uh, this was this was a really great uh, getting to know Senator. Okay. And your Good. history and your background. Because I think that's really interesting, at least to me, and I hope other people feel the same way, is, is you know, because yeah, we learned so much. Like, I learned a whole lot about why you do and why you say the things you do based on your experiences as a kid growing up and all that stuff yeah. and your radio experience. And that's really, I think it's really important to know these things and to know the evolution of the equipment, how you were lugging around one inch or two inch tape. It's like, Jesus you know, I've got to uh, tell you that. Now, fortunately, when we were doing that uh, public broadcasting stuff on that Ampex suitcase two inch tape, uh, that kind of, a, that was, we called that a remote. Uh, and uh, that required engineers. So I didn't lug around, but it did require that we took a, uh, we had a cube van kind of a truck, and we had a couple engineers and the simple sound mixer and that and the, we took waveform monitors but it was a lot more complex than it is now and, and you see all these people going around shooting stuff and it's a whole different world and, and i watched the tv shows and and i gotta tell you I, again because that seems to have been the nature of this whole conversation uh as opposed to maybe a technical diatribe of stuff but it all boils down to storytelling. And if you can't tell a story on mini DV, you really aren't going to be able to tell a story better on a red weapon. Oh, I love that name, by the way. Their new camera is called the weapon. The weapon, yeah. And they I got to it back through TSA, right? What's, what's this? Oh, it's a red weapon. A what? <laughs> yeah, and then, and then they've got the other one is the hydrogen, or the hydra, or something. The little cell phone looking thing. Yeah. But yeah, it's the hydrogen, and I'm know, not sure what it's going to do. About the storytelling, you know, if if you want to make a video that looks like a video, then you make a video that looks like a video. If you want to make something that looks like a move, something that will immerse people. And, and literally suck them out of whatever you've got going around you. You know, I, I talk about this. I think Jeff Wexler talks about the same thing with a different phrase, about things that suck you out of the story. When you're watching something and you are into the story and you don't notice 
anything technical. It, if it sounds bad and you notice that it sounds bad, you've been sucked out of the story. If there's a line of ADR and it, it wasn't blended well, and it clearly is ADR as, as so many times, it sucks you out of the story. Uh, I have seen stuff and been involved with stuff in projects where there is stuff, I'll tell you what, the eye brain process is really a slut. It's really very easy. You can, <laughs> you can fool the eye brain. You can put stuff past the eye brain that the ear brain will never tolerate that amount of distraction or disruption or unusualness. I mean, I'm, ta I'm talking about the boom operator and boom being in the shot. I was watching a show, uh, uh, something on uh, an older show on Amazon Prime, and I'm like, wow, there's, oh, it was uh, Oz. It was, I was watching it on HBO, Oz. I'm like, holy cow, there's the boom. It's right in the shot. <laughs> it's um, right there. I, I did a shot. I'm not going to say I'm proud of it. This was, like I say, back a long time ago. Uh, another one of those war stories. And the idea of war stories, which, which the same guy that wanted me to teach the students how to record production sound, he also felt that I was certainly wasting the, the class time by telling war stories. And, I, and these stories are all lessons. And, you know, they may be an individual little story, but the lesson is kind of mega. And this goes way back, living in Hawaii and doing a lot of TV work. And uh, we, we had this the blood bank was something that was like, you know, non station, non network. And all of the, the, the three major news anchors and PBS. So it was ABC, NBC, CBS and the PBS all agreed to be in this one promotional film for the blood bank of Hawaii. And they decided to do it on 16 millimeter film. Um, so it shows you how far back we were in the mid, uh, early to mid eighties. Um, and we go out. And so each of the, the, the television personalities uh, made their pitch about the importance of, of us all participating in the blood bank, understanding uh, also well before AIDS and a lot of those things. And we went in one case to get one of the anchors uh, doing their pitch, sitting on their news set. So we went to the TV station during the day and the cameraman set up the, who was also the director, set up the camera, CP16, sets it up, getting the shot, uh, of the anchor sitting there at the anchor desk and only the anchor's position is even lit. And I said, well, how, how big is the picture? Um, not that big. It's about yay wide, kind of like what we're doing here, I guess. I said, okay. And I sat down at the, at the weather position at the far end of the anchor desk in the dark. I am in the dark and I'm sitting there with my Nagra. And we recorded this guy doing his pitch, you know, no, 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 the blood bank. Did the others, did all of the stuff in the field, went to the blood bank, got pit, all of the stuff to make this, I don't know, 15, 20 minute film. We get invited to the premiere at the blood bank. They're gonna show the film projected on a 16 millimeter projector. And that was what they, they would send these prints of the, around to the schools. And the schools were still projecting 16 millimeter stuff in the, to the students, you know, and, right. and bingo clubs and whatever. And we're sitting there, and this is the premiere of the film. And I'm sitting there, and I watch. And we come to this part with Tim Tyndall, my good friend, the anchor, sitting there doing his bit. And to cover a cut... It turns out my close personal friend, the director and DP, had shot 15, 20 seconds of a big wide shot of the set with just the, the center part illuminated where the anchor guy was sitting. But he shot this big shot so that he could edit it, cut away, right? 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right in the middle of it. <laughs> no, I was on the side, but there I am sitting there. And they hadn't noticed it all the way through. And I had to point out, I said, you know, I'm in that picture. <laughs> but I wasn't moving. I was in the dark. You can fool the eye brain a lot easier. If you got a hum on the audio, everybody knows and goes, audio. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Senator, I really appreciate you uh, doing this. Uh, we got to do another one because I know okay. you get a lot more. Do yourself a favor and subscribe right now because when you do, you'll get notified when I upload new videos with lots of cool information. Information that I learned from lots of expensive college and years of experience. Only you get it for free. So subscribe right now.